the dean uh, sandeep choudhury uh, dr abha sharma dr nidhi and dr sanjay please Most welcome, sir, Dr. Anurag Varshne from Patanjali. So moving moving on, I now invite our director, Dr. U.S.N. Murtiji, to welcome our valuable guests and delegates, and to address the gathering to formally open the uh, symposium event. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh. Good morning, especially my industry colleague, Dr. Jitender, and uh, Dr. Anurag. Uh, very good morning to all of you and welcome to our wonderful campus, Sniper Library, virtually and looking forward to see you physically very soon. And the faculty of my Sniper family, Library, and especially today's hero, Dr. Rakesh, who organized, who is well planned this industry academy, are bringing them to a common day. Uh, you are very successful in bringing them, and my colleagues and uh, from uh, Sniper Library, faculty colleagues. And most beautiful students of my Niper Rivalry, both uh, scholars as well as students. And welcome to this wonderful session today. It is well articulated that industry perspectives on the transactional changes in the drug development. First of all, you see the title Industry Academia built up is there for the past four and a half decades. We are talking about the Industry Academia, Industry Academia, but who is going to build the cat? What industry needs tomorrow, it should be understood by the students today with the help of faculty. Then only you will be absorbed by the industry very quickly. Otherwise, it is very difficult. And why NIPERS are very, very important and why they are very attractive compared to the other state government colleges or other colleges of pharma in India. Because my students, they can predict the market of tomorrow and day after tomorrow, even today itself. That's why they will be absorbed. This is nothing but the convoluted brains of the Niper students and for which some kind of a sharpening is required. That is nothing but the adding the element of industry element into their young brains so that I can see in the uh, my classroom of auditorium of all the students in another decades, they will be CEOs of company. They will be the chief guest of the uh, my Niper library symposium another five to six years or eight years. So only thing is for them to make them, you, you see, when you are making, talking about the make in India or BA Indian, buy Indian, you should see the first of all, one day, one decade, the planning is now itself is required for which we are in the one side of the bank, industry is in the other side of the bank. No one is dare enough to jump into the river and then swim and the other people join the hands and all. Now this is the one and to the, our today's guests I want 
wanted to just inform something about the great institute of raibareli this is a one which has come up with the flying colors recently with an nir of ranking of 13 within no time well, nir of ranking is only based on the many parameters we are we have ourselves proved in all aspects right from the perception onwards and quality because how quality will come when you have an ability when ability will come there is a stability stability will come come clarity clarity will come overall visibility of the institute that is the visibility of the niper what we have because of the wonderful faculty supported by technical staff and administrative staff as well and let me congratulate dr rakesh for selecting this topic and all and what is the main hurdles even i was a chief scientist in iict for more than csir lab for 3 and 1/2 decades for the past one decade only this industry academia collaboration is coming closer and all because we also got some educated yes what is required and all now if you see the power of the drug development of this country entire western countries are knee down before the great nation of the india for the hcq hydrochloric hydroxychloroquine the entire we supplied millions and billions of dollars to the western countries that is the power of Uh, this country when we are having built in power can't we have our own drug development in spite of having synthetic as well as high throughput the high powering high super computing power third one is the having the immense wealth of the natural products in the country who are bringing one by one one by one like patanjali and all and they are bringing slowly one by one to the uh, market and all only thing is communication gap we are excellent in working and poor in networking this is one of the and wonderful uh, attempt to make it uh, that uh, networking and bring them to the this one giving a small example many academic laboratories are interested in the researching the disease network now this is very important especially to youngsters when you want to work in a plasmodium we should understand the biology of malaria in i am there in the few interviews whenever i said i am working on the cancer when i ask a cancer biology itself they don't know then what is the question of talking about the where is the meaning for your uh, drug development conferences drug development uh, workshops and all no first of all disease biology is the first and foremost when you want to work in any disease take it is a oa arthritis osteoarthritis or ra first of all let us see what is the main factor of it how many parties are involved in the disease and all then only you will know what is what most important one more thing is for the youngsters i am telling in the next week we are going to have a collaboration with the dbt initiative pharmaco genomics to go to that pharmaco genomics first of all you understand the genomics first then don't try don't try to jump into the pharmaco genomics directly this is the first and foremost topic to understand before going for a drug development and we are not going to start the ms pharmaco genomics separately this is a topic of each and every department whatever we have five departments in niper raibareli what is this this is a beautiful country which has got more than 4561 different varieties of the uh, races traits and all epigenetics can be studied only in this country 435 varieties of tribal population which are having different resistance mechanism if you give a drug to the one individual they will respond immediately another one will not respond it is only gene specific character first of all for that purpose fundamentals in the genomic should be taught followed by pharmacogenomics and with the indian institute of science he was their director in the dbt uh, institute vesnet kalyani he is a institute of pharmacogenomics department of biotechnology now he came back to iis iisc indian institute of science bangalore we are going to have a dialogue with him and frame a syllabus even for the 2022 even if it is not in the syllabus for our second year student and first year students make a special classes for them induct some element of the pharmacogenomics that is the first step for the drug development so these are all the topics which are the missing links in the drug development chain we are having the high computing power are we using completely for this how many people are knows about uh, department of science and technology and cdac has developed one kind of a collaboration that is called uh, param siddhi with 650 teraflop that means we are having a wonderful mic and there is no singer or uh, either male singer or female singer to sing the song so we have to bring them and make them as a interdisciplinary scientist they should talk to the chemistry they should talk to the biology cbi chemistry biology interface and then they should talk, talk to the first traditional medicine people which is there in the uh, naipur kolkata as well as uh, naipur mohali and uh, how to make all these things as a chain and they make as a capsule form 
so that the meaning of drug development will be justified for a period of at least a decade let us not over claim on all those things at least decade for that purpose knock the door of all the industries get the their idea what they need tomorrow and then you see can we make a plan systematic plan for that this kind of periodical conferences periodical symposium certainly will give a throw uh, certainly throw a light on the a small ray of hope of the drug development in the country that is very much needed why we are thinking have you heard anything about the diseases of 20 years back we in two only two types communicable and non communicable from 80s onwards dengue 80 90s onwards chikungunya and again orphan disease emerging disease re emerging disease we are at the bottom only diseases are going up huge imbalance is there this is the time of the youngsters to take up and jump into the venture of the drug development may not be a immediate cash crop let me tell you normally the young generation they will see for the short term benefits and long term losses please don't look into it so you see the long term benefit ella krishna and suchitra ella they came forward the covaxin only after two and half decades till that time there is no good business they actually there they never felt that they never gave gave off anything are this is loss business and all but whatever the loss of the 30 years is there if they feel loss but they never felt it is a loss whatever 30 years of the what uh, you not seeing the market not seeing the light of the day of the vaccine suddenly it came and it is only the answer even to the western countries now the covaxin which is a indigenous one and all so these are all the things one should understand and one should get it absorbed then finally have a Uh, brainstorming among yourself and with a group that is a group discussion is a very very it play important role in the mbs elections of naipur of course even in iim also once you discuss discuss then only you come to the uh, one kind of a solution that is i am i always tell before going to the sutix 3d technology you first see about your 3d what is 3d discuss debate and decide then only you will come up with a mini kind of uh, Uh, some facts which are hidden under the massive heaps of the data which is not required right now with this few introduction few lines of introduction once again i welcome dr jitender dr anurag and dr mahesh to this wonderful session soon we are going to see all of you physically in our beautiful campus before concluding i wanted to tell uh, this naipur is going to be the third naipur to have its permanent campus and our construction is going to start in another one year our next conference will be physically in the new campus welcome once again जय हिंद थैंक यू सर थैंक यू फॉर योर एनलाइटेनिंग वर्ड्स एंड सेटिंग द स्टेज फॉर टूडेज इवेंट थैंक्स थैंक्स अ लॉट सो मूविंग ऑन एज द एज आवर डायरेक्टर क्लियरली इम्फेसाइज दैट द स्टोरी ऑफ ए सक्सेस सक्सेसफुल ट्रांसलेशन ऑफ ए ड्रग फ्रॉम बेंच टू बेड साइड इंक्लूड्स various stages from lab testing to the final regulatory approval and to its launch to the market but the process is very long risky and with high failure rates and it's a costly affair after all so to practically understand this process with better clarity we have with, with us the first distinguished speaker of the day dr jitender satigiri the title of his talk in today's event is approaches to overcome the translational roadblocks in drug development before uh, we invite him to deliver his talk let me introduce you all with him dr jitender satigiri has earned his phd in organic chemistry from indian institute of science bangalore he did his post doctoral research at university of illinois and national taiwan university in 1999 Dr Satigiri started his professional career as a medicinal chemist and drug discovery professional at Renbexi Research Laboratories in the year 1999 while at Renbexi he handled several projects across various therapeutic areas including metabolic disorders respiratory disorders and infectious diseases as Renbexi was taken over by Daichi in 2008 he became the senior director in the division of chemistry at Daichi Sankyo India where he led drug discovery teams and significantly contributed in discovery of several preclinical and clinical candidates including rbx10558 uh, a super statin for treating the conditions of hypercholesteremia this drug candidate was later out uh, out licensed to ppd and completed phase 2 clinical trials 
He has led global teams responsible for clinical development projects in anti-infective area. In this role, he coordinated extensively with multidisciplinary stakeholders to ensure seamless project progress and performance. Dr. Satigri is a global R&D leader with over 25 years of rich industrial experience in organic and medicinal chemistry, uh, discovery, development, portfolio management, and people management. Since 2018, he is serving as Global Program Director in Novartis and globally responsible for maintenance and drug development activities for the marketed ophthalmological drug products of Novartis. He closely collaborates with cross-functional teams in Novartis Institute of Biomedical Research for manufacturing, global drug development, and their commercial reorganization. He is also the site head for global program management line function of Novartis Hyderabad site. He is an inventor on 31 international patents with 29 publications, research publications in international journals, and has contributed book chapter in obstructive airway diseases which is his expertise area. So with this brief introduction, I invite Dr. Satigiri to deliver his talk and share his valuable rich experience with us and our students. Sir, over to you, please. Thank you, Rakesh. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you, Naipur, for inviting me to this very, very pertinent uh, webinar. And thank you so much, Dr. Murthy, for giving that opening remarks. And while you were talking, I was just trying to visualize all that I have in the presentation today that I'll be talking, mainly focusing towards the students of Niper. You already touched upon that. So I think at least it gives me a confidence that our thought process matches here and probably we will be looking at what we are talking. We'll be in sync. Thank you. So let me start sharing my screen and please let me know, Rakesh, if you can see that. Yes. There, there is a lag time. It will come. Sir. It will take uh, maybe a few seconds. Yeah, it's there. We it can there. see. Yeah. Okay, good. So let's begin then. I see my friend Anurag also on the call. Hi, Anurag. There's an opportunity to say hello to you after a long time. So Rakesh, I would like again thank you uh, for choosing this very appropriate uh, title for this webinar, uh, which I think any student who is in the pharmaceutical industry uh, studying pharmaceutical sciences should be aware of. What the translational challenges are when we talk of drug discovery and development. Uh, since I am in presently the drug development area, so I will be focusing the translational challenges related to drug development. To begin with, I think I realized when I started preparing that most of the audience for today would be the students, the pharmacy students at Niper. And that's the reason I kept this in a kind of an overview, trying to take trying to take the students through why, what, and how of why this translational challenge that we are having a whole day webinar is important, what it means and how the industries and the academia have been trying to address this issue. Like I heard Rakesh talking about in the beginning when he was introducing that the translational challenge impacts severely the probability of success or how the drugs fail in the clinical development, the cost of the development, that it takes to bring a drug from, I mean, I can limit it here from phase one, once it enters into the clinical trial to launch and the time it takes to bring the drug from, let's say, from the start of the race till end of the race, that is approval and launch in the market. And as you can see, all of these three factors can severely impact the availability of safe and efficacious treatment for the patients. I'm sure as pharmacy students, all of you are very well aware of this particular drug discovery and development continuum. Uh, but for the discussion for today, 
I am bringing it up here so that it helps us in discussion. As you realize, the whole story starts with the exploratory research, wherein the target identification and validation takes place. Once that happens, it's transferred to the discovery chemist and biologist, wherein the lead identification optimization process starts. A very iterative process wherein the chemist synthesizes, sends it to the biologist for uh, in vitro testing, uh, sends it to DMPK for metabolic stabilities and all that. And then you have PK and efficacy studies in animal models. Once an appropriately optimized lead is obtained, it is taken up for preclinical pre -clinical development in appropriate animal models again. And once a safety is established, it enters for the first time into the human clinical trials and goes through different phases of phase one, phase two, and phase three. Uh, before the application can be filed with the appropriate health authorities, uh, wait for the review and approval, and then finally it is launched. If you look at how long this story takes from birth till end, I mean, as you realize, the exploratory part till the preclinical can take anywhere up to two to three years. The chart in the middle, which I have taken from a recent publication, clearly says how each different phases go through in different time phases. And you can see that although this has been taken from the data starting from 2006 till 2015, there is not much of a difference as of today. Almost like over a period of 10 years, the number of months that is taken either in phase one, phase two, or phase three kind of remains constant, although there are little ups and downs. And that could actually be dependent on what drug area we are talking about, what therapeutic area we are talking about, uh, that variation we are seeing here. And when you calculate the whole time period here, it can take up to 13 years to launch a drug starting from the discovery phase, which actually is a very, very long time, as you can imagine. And 13 years is on a conservative side. When we talk of cost of bringing to the drug, to the market, and you look at the literature, there have been many, many estimates of how, how much it takes to bring a drug to the market, and there have been the estimates have been ranging from 314 million US dollars to 2.8 billion US dollars. However, I am looking at the recent analysis which was published in 2020, and they looked at around 63 drugs uh, which were approved by FDA between 2009 and 2018. And they estimated that the development cost was around 1.34 billion dollars US dollars. Now, for somebody who is uninitiated to this, you may be wondering as to why $1.34 billion is needed to bring one drug from beginning till end. Does it cost so much really? And especially when you look at this numbers, wherein it says that the cost of a clinical trial, phase one, phase two, and phase three, can at the most maximum be $35 million. Then where does this number $1.34 billion comes in? I think we need to remember that the cost of bringing a drug to the market does not just depend on how much you spend on a particular clinical trial or how much you spend in the lab. It takes care, it includes all the direct and indirect costs. It includes all the establishment's costs, like what they call the capitalized costs. It also includes the cost of all the failures that have happened over this period. So it's not just about this success of this drug to launch, but it is about including the failure cost of the other drugs as well. What is the probability of a success when a drug enters into the, for the first time into the clinical trials in the humans? And this is very beautifully represented here in the chart format. Uh, the authors looked at the data for seven years, starting from 2010 till 2017. And not much has changed till uh, after that also. Although I'll be touching upon this towards the end of my talk again. But for now, just remember that not much has changed. The topmost bar represents the probability of success for a drug once it has entered into phase three to be launched. 
and that appears to be quite high, like 62 up to 62 percent success ratio. However, when you come to the gray area, the gray hexagons, which represents the success of a drug to transition from phase two to phase three, it's only around 25 percent. Indicating that almost 75 percent of the drugs that enter the phase two do not transition to phase three, a very big loss. And the bottom most line, which is in the dark gray, which is having numbers like six and seven, represent the overall success ratio for the molecules or the drug candidates that enter phase one. What is their success probability that it can be launched? And as you can see, it is around seven percent, indicating that less than one molecule that enters the clinical trials is one in ten, less than one in ten can actually be launched. A very poor record. And when you start looking at the reasons why this fails, 52% of the drugs fail in the clinical trials because of the efficacy. The next big reason for failure is the safety. Together, they account for around 76% of the reasons why drugs fail. Of course, there are other reasons like 15% is a strategy, which of course has nothing to do with the science part of it, but it becomes important like when we talk of 13 years for a drug development, lot of lot can happen within the 13 years. Companies can be bought over by somebody, companies can change. And when the new company takes over, they would have a different strategy and they will find that this particular molecule that is being developed does not fit into their portfolio and they would just drop it irrespective of what the result has been. And commercial reasons like. Probably by the time you complete your clinical trials over this long period, you will find that somebody else has launched the drugs and you are no more competitive in the market and then companies decide not to launch it in the market. So with this background, we come to what we call the loss in the translation. So what has happened here when we talk about 75% loss, right? We did not just pick up a molecule from the lab and brought it to the clinical trials. We did a lot of basic science here in the lab. We evaluated all the cells, uh, studies in the cell. We did in this evaluated in this uh, animal models, a lot of different animal models. We studied PK, we studied TOX. But then we need to get to the clinical sciences for doing the human clinical trials, it did not somehow translate. And this chasm between the basic science and the clinical research is sometimes referred to the valley of death, where most of the molecules just come and drop down and there's no way to resurrect them. And this happens, unfortunately, despite all the fascinating observations, the science that we create in the labs, that this is not being I'm sorry, there is some sound coming from the background. Y'all please mute yourself. Okay, thank you. So what happens here is all the studies that have been done at the lab in the basic sciences level. At some point it has been realized that many of the things are irrelevant to the human diseases. And we'll, we will look at it a little more, maybe surprising at this point, but let us look at it as we move on. So this is where the translational research comes into play. And this translational research in a very simple term is a bridge between basic science and the clinical research which helps drugs to take from, as you call, the bench to bedside. <coughs> it's actually, in simple terms, process of applying the knowledge gained in the basic science to the clinical practice. It's a lot iterative process, as we will talk about in the next slide. It's not just, just a unidirectional that is about basic science going to clinical science, but it is about going back and forth between basic and the clinical research involves a lot, lot of research findings, sharing of research findings between both uh, lab scale and the clinical levels. 
would like to spend some time on this to go over this particular uh, chart here. We know about the basic science, which is basically as we talked about target identification, validation, lead identification, optimization, a lot of animal studies. People who are involved in discovery research also realize there is a lot of issues with the translation. And that translation limited to within that particular blue box, which is about how do we translate the in vitro activity into the animal activity? How do we find a very potent compound in the enzyme activity to show a required effective efficacy in animal models? Have good PK. So there is a lot of iteration going on and also a lot of uh, translational issues that are there in the basic science level. But when we talk of actually the translational research, that is about the interaction between the clinical research in uh, observations and going back and forth between the basic science lab and the uh, clinical research. It's a very iterative process, involves generic collection of a lot of data, analysis, and dissemination between not just the pharmaceutical companies. It involves dissemination between pharmaceutical companies, the academia, the government institutions, and anybody else who is involved in this research. And health requires a lot of collaboration. It requires a lot of understanding and interpreting the molecular information that is generated by either microarrays, proteomics, genomics, involving the clinical samples that are coming from the tissues, patient tissues, the blood samples, or any of the body fluids, trying to understand the disease state, differentiate the disease state versus a healthy state. And that information gets shared with the basic science to develop further the science and find new uh, therapeutic options to treat these particular diseases. And as you can imagine, since it involves the clinical samples to be studied, it can be a very, very challenging and expensive affair here. There are several reasons, possible reasons that have been looked at why translational research fails. I'll not go into detail of each one of them, but just to bring it to your notice that, I mean, it could be as simple as that, that the results that we see in cultured cells do not translate into animal studies, as I mentioned. Uh, there is a failure to effective integration of data coming from different technological approaches to the diseases. And I, as I mentioned, this involves a lot of uh, clinical studies, clinical samples. So actually access to the animal uh, human tissues and appropriate materials itself can be a big issue. It has also been pointed out that some of the very simple methods like the statistical analysis methods, misinterpretation and misuse of the p-values at the lab scale and trying to overinterpret the data can also lead to the loss in uh, the effectiveness of the drugs when we take them to the clinics not enough collaboration between the government, academia, and industries, as we heard in the introduction as well. And of course, many times we have found that what we have tried to develop at the lab scale in the discovery research, those targets actually may not be very applicable uh, when we go to the human studies. The last one, and again, like what Dr. Murthy also mentioned, the high heterogeneity of the patient population. This is one of the main reasons why the drugs fail when we go to the uh, human clinical trials. And for today's discussion, I'm going to be focusing on this particular point, assuming that rest all have been taken care of. And we'll be talking about this particular high heterogeneity in patient population, how it is handled. This was a paper published in Nature not very long ago wherein the authors looked at top 10 selling drugs in the market in US. And what they concluded is, if you have to see a good response in one patient, you need to administer this, these drugs from anywhere from four to 25 patients. 
and I'm sure you can identify many of these drugs which we also use very regularly. So when you look at it, you can very clearly understand the kind of burden that this observation uh, puts on the healthcare system. We have been administrating drugs to the patients who really don't need them or will not see any effect. And we are also exposing the patients to some kind of adverse events. There's no efficacy there definitely, but anyway, since we are administering some drugs, there can always be some kind of side effects. So we are having a, this kind of a situation here. Now, why does this come here? Why does this happen like this? We just need to look at how the classical clinical trials have been conducted, wherein we generally look at few observations in maybe hundreds to thousands of the patients and then send it for approval and launch it in the market where millions of patients are administered these drugs. We haven't studied how this particular drug is effective across the whole spectrum of population. And this is the result of that. In short, we have been taking always what we call the one size fits all approach. Uh, it's becoming very, very clear now that one size fits all approach is not going to work anymore. Uh, it would not have worked, but we are recognizing that it doesn't work. And that's the reason it is leading us to talk about precision medicine. So precision medicine is in simple terms, administering drugs to a specific subset of population who have specific genetic markers, cellular markers, and where there is a possibility that these drugs will be highly effective. So oncology has been at the forefront of precision trial design, wherein the goal is to individualize a patient's treatment based on their unique tumor profile. And in some of my examples, we will see this, what we mean by unique tumor profile. This has been one of the biggest headache when we talk of the oncology uh, drug treatment. Uh, I'm sure this is for everything, but for today's discussion, to keep it simple, I'm just taking one example set of examples here. So the key advantage of the potential treatment for precision medicine is to be able to predict how individual will respond to a given therapy. With significant advances in the cancer genomics, we are now able to predict what are the genotypes of a particular tumor and what particular medicine might be suitable to treat those tumors. And also it has been very, very helpful in looking or developing on the biomarker platforms to be able to diagnose and predict the treatment course. The chart here actually kind of gives you how people have picked up the concept of precision medicine starting from 2013. The trajectory is increasing significantly and this represents only up to 2016. Uh, I didn't have the data till recent, but I'm sure if you look at extend the trajectory till 2022, it is going to be a very steep curve. And what we are going to talk is about the use of biomarkers and the significant impact on the precision clinical trial success. So what are molecular biomarkers then? Uh, first of all, the biomarkers approach is being touted as one of the major approaches to reduce the translational gap in identification and development uh, of any cancer uh, therapies. So molecular biomarker is an objective and quantifiable measurement of any biological signature. Uh, for example, RNAs, DNAs, proteins, metabolites, which are derived from patients or healthy, uh, healthy subject uh, specimens for comparison purpose from their tissues, blood, or any other body fluids like saliva, that substitute for an ideally uh, and able to ideally predict the clinical relevant endpoints. Molecular biomarkers can also optimize clinical trial design 
through the improved patient selection. And this becomes important, like what we talked about in a classical, we would just uh, select few patients without knowing their uh, genotypes. Here, with, when we talk of biomarkers, we do the diagnosis and select the patients based on who have the high probability of success. Now, when we have to use the biomarker for this kind of clinical designs and success, it is very apt that these biomarkers need to be very, very reliable, robust, and reproducible of a clinical response. It becomes a responsibility of the companies or the sponsors who are developing these biomarkers to take them through the full gamut of development. And just to add here, the development of a biomarker is not, not simple. It almost takes the same development path like any drug. It needs to be approved by competent healthcare, healthcare authorities so that it can be uh, administered or used while uh, giving the therapies here for any treatment. A very simple, a simple uh, illustration of what happens. A blood of the tissue specimen is taken from the patients. A molecular analysis is performed. Data is analyzed to identify appropriate biomarkers. And this appropriately identified biomarker then goes through a series of developmental activities along with, in the present times, most of the biomarker development happens along with the drug development schedule from phase one till the launch, because they are now being touted as what you call the companion diagnostics. So I think it's important to remember that biomarkers can be class classified mainly into three types, diagnostic biomarkers, prognostic biomarkers, and predictive biomarkers. As the name suggests, direct diagnostic biomarkers aid in diagnosis of the disease. Once you identify that a particular disease with a particular genotype or a <clears throat> makeup exists, it also helps in kind of predicting the prognosis of the disease, how will it progress, and also can be used as a predictive biomarker to say whether the patient will have derived any benefits from the treatment that we are talking about here. For example, cystic fibrosis, as you know, is a lung, severe lung disease, and it is caused by genetic mutations in the CFTR gene, which encodes for the proteins uh, CFTR, uh, membrane protein, which is responsible for transport of chloride and bicarbonates across the membrane. With the mute, there are multiple mutations that happen in CFTR. And what, with this mutation, the whole transport activity has been disturbed and can lead to severe uh, lung diseases. Vertex had developed a drug, Evacaftor, which actually targets a particular mutation in the safety R gene, which is glycine 551 to ascorbic acid. And this diagnostic marker that has been developed actually helps you to look at that spectrum of cystic fibrosis patients who might have this particular mutation. And Evacaftor is prescribed only those patients who have the mutation of G551D. Prognostic biomarkers, as it indicates, that it is used to predict or understand how the disease is likely to progress, what, whether it will, recur, it will recur in the patients. And for example here, <clears throat> breast cancer genes, BARCA1 and 2, mutations when they occur, it's a very good prognostic marker to say that the patients who have even after they have gone the tumor uh, operation for breast cancer, they are likely to have a second recurrence of the breast cancer. The predictive biomarkers. This is, I think, the most important uh, 
of the whole precision medicine where it helps you to identify the patients who are most likely to respond to a drug. And this is where it takes care of your non-heterogeneity of the patient population, identifying those subtypes or subgroups of the patient population who have that specific uh, genotype who might benefit from the drug that you are targeting. And as we move, we look at the examples of how it is working and how it is helpful with some live examples. And as I said, I mean, the precision medicine has been most advanced as far as the cancer treatment is concerned. So I'll be taking some few examples to drive home the point how this has been working, how people have been trying to take care of the translation research for collaboration between the basic science and the clinical research and come up with something which can be more meaningful for treating the cancer patients of particular subtype. I'll start with the story of Herceptin. It's a monoclonal antibody, uh, targets uh, human epidermal uh, factor receptor 2, which is an oncogene. It has been very closely linked with breast cancer outcomes. The tissue sample analysis, it has been shown very clearly that around 25% of the breast cancer tumors have excess of HER2 expression. And just to get that perspective of what do we mean by overexpressed, in a normal cell, there might be 20,000 uh, HER2 expressions on the cell surface, but in an oncogenic cell, you can expect up to 2 million of these HER2 uh, receptors. And then this can lead to adverse downstream signaling, uh, leading to uncontrolled cell growth, proliferation, and differentiations. Till a treatment was found for this, HER2 expression was always used as to predict the prognosis of breast cancer in the patients. In 1986, HER2 was identified as oncogene by Genentech, uh, which is a well-known company. And they had been working on to identify some inhibitors for this particular receptor. And this is an interesting story. Although in 1998, Herceptin was approved in combination with the paclitaxel chemotherapy for HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. But there is an interesting story here, uh, which again highlights the translational challenge. Genentech was working on mouse monoclonal antibody to inhibit EGFR2. They could find very good in vivo efficacy in animal models, very good tumor shrinkages. Everything was very good. And they took it to the human clinical trial, first in human clinical trial. They found with the first injection that it was rejected by the human body. It was, there was a lot of allergic reaction because this was a mouse monoclonal antibody not accepted by the human body. So with this observation in the clinic, the information was sent back to the basic science group where they started working on this information which came out of the clinics. And they very intelligently modified this molecular antibody uh, and made it chimeric, that is humanized, uh, retaining the mouse portion to bind with EGFR, but then connected to the human antibody. And that's how Herceptin came into existence. So this is the first example of how translational research happened by collaboration between the clinical research and the basic science group. So how the companion diagnostics came into existence. And this has now become a very important uh, event for many of the diseases, many of the drugs that are being developed by the companies. Uh, before I go into this, let me kind of give a little bit about companion diagnostic. It is nothing but a diagnostic marker thing, but it is generally presented along with the drug treatment. So it comes as a pack or together. And before you actually advise a patient to take a particular drug X, you use a companion diagnostic kit to make sure 
that the patient has the particular genotype which can be a beneficial can benefit from the drug that you are going to treat so the first example of how it came up so there is another epidermal growth factor her1 or also known as her b1 uh, which is again oncogenic involved in uh, intracellular signaling and its role in colorectal uh, uh, cancer has been well established. It has been found to be upregulated up to 80% of the cases of colorectal cancers and of course in other cancers as well. And while Imclone, a biotech company in those times when it was working, it came up with this cetuximab which binds with the extracellular domain of EGF or HER1 and then by blocking the ligand binding and receptor activation and all the downstream signaling. It was approved for three tumor, different tumor types, non-small cell lung cancer, squamous cell cancer for head and neck, and also of course the uh, colorectal cancers, <clears throat> which are overexpressing EGF or HER1. And here itself with the product development was happening, for cetuximab, it involved validation of both the diagnostics uh, to identify if the tumors that they are trying to treat have overexpression of EGFR uh, HER1 or not. While people were working on this, Inclone developed it and it was launched in the market along with uh, Eli Lilly. There were other companies also who were working and two years later, Amgen brought to market something uh, what is called as a penetumumab, map, another map to target the same receptor, EGFR, and they use the same strategy of patient selection as cetuximab. That is to say, they diagnose the patient population who had overexpression of EGFR and took them into clinical trials and they went ahead with that. While all this was happening, it soon was realized that cetuximab was not showing up the kind of efficacy that was expected of it. And there was somewhere some, some people already knew that something was not right in the company and there is a big story behind that maybe some for some other day that is and since even penetumumab was along the same line and cetuximab was not showing uh, expected efficacy although they all the patient tumors were showing significant overexpression of egfr it was kind of per perplexing to both the clinical research scientists as well as the basic scientists as to what is happening here so the clinical research samples were looked into retrospectively from the patients who had been treated with cetuximab monotherapy alone to see why, how to stratify the patient groups which showed some efficacy and the groups which did not show any efficacy. And it was found that the groups did not show if it, that did not show any efficacy had another constitutively activating mutations in a gene called Kirsten rat sarcoma, CRAS gene. There were multiple mutations that were found and in the subgroup which showed efficacy, these mutations were not present in the tumor. This was a very, very important revelation that came up at that point of time. And when European medicine agencies was looking at penetumumab approval, they made it very, very clear that this drug can be approved or approved or given to the patients who had overexpression of EGFR and were negative for the crash status. And likewise, following up on this example, FDA actually reversed their decision and they made it very clear that even cetuximab can be administered only to the patients who had uh, crash mutant negative status. So this was the first example where this kind of companion diagnostic hey, was made. Hey, you have to keep the kids in the house? Huh? 
I'm sorry, sir. There, there is a background from somebody. I just muted it. Oh, OK, thank you. No problem. <clears throat> so another example of how companion diagnostic coming of age, and this is an example for Vemirafinib and BRAF mutations. The previous two examples that I took was for monoclonal antibodies. Uh, Vemirafinib is a small molecule uh, brought out by Plexicon and then by Daichi Sankyo. BRAF gene encodes for protein uh, belonging to the RAF family of serine threonine protein kinases and a background information. And again, this uh, plays a very significant role in regulating the MAP kinase and the ERK signaling pathway, uh, which is actually again the downstream of EGFR uh, signaling pathway and involved in cell division, cell differentiation, proliferation. And you can imagine that if there is a mutation here, it can go in an uncontrolled manner. Again, many of the tumors in the malignant uh, melanoma have shown that more than two thirds of this have mutations in the BRAF gene. What was interesting was more than 80% of these mutations were found to be a single amino acid substitution valine to glutamic acid. And this correlated very with very poor prognosis. And this was a very interesting observation which Plexicon found out and they did a lot of uh, high throughput crystallography at that point of time with their platform technologies. And they came up with a drug molecule called Vemurafenin, which was targeted for uh, against BRAF, uh, showing this particular mutation, which is valine 602 glutamic acid. And this, when they were developing the drug, as I was saying, they actually took up developing the diagnostic kit right from the beginning. And even for the phase two patient selection, they used the PCR based genomic stratification to include only those melanoma patients which had this particular mutations. And as you can see, when they did this, they had a remarkable more than 80% partial or complete responses that were shown when they looked at these patients who were positive to particular uh, BRAF mutation. And even in the phase three trials, using this diagnostic kit, they found that the efficacy was significantly uh, seen. And with these examples, I have tried to show that how it has been important to go back and forth between the clinical research and the basic sciences, and that is what the translational research is all about. Because when we start, we would not have known that this many different type of mutations would come up as we move forward. And unless there had been that iterative and collaborative process, this would not have been possible to cross that uh, valley. So, before I close, I'd like to put this question to all of you. I mean, or to myself actually also. So I've given you some examples of biomarkers and how the difference uh, they have been used. And in the beginning, I was showing the probability of success in the different clean stages of clinical trial. So the question that comes up is, and we talked about the precision medicine and all that. So the question that comes up is, has use of biomarker really made a difference to the clinical trial success that we actually in the beginning set out to make? So this is a recent report which has looked at what has been the impact of success in the clinical trials, and they compared it with the trials which used biomarkers and which did not use biomarkers. And they looked at the trials which were conducted between 2011 and 2020. And uh, I mean, just for the sake of uh, understanding, these were all the company sponsored FDA registering enabling development programs. You really see that there has been some difference. We can see here, like on the rightmost graph, phase one to approval in the first graph that I showed you, the probability of success was around 7%. Once a molecule enters phase one, 
and up to the launch, the probability was only up to 7%. But with the use of biomarker, it has been found that that success has almost doubled. Now, the second pair of graphs from the left hand side, which talks about phase two to phase three transition. In the chart, again, if I refer back to the first third slide, I had shown that the probability of success was around 25% to move from phase two to phase three, and most of the failures are because of the efficacy and toxicity. Here, by use of biomarkers, what the data has said is from around 28% in that analysis, the success ratio has increased to 46%. So with this slide, I leave with the thought that one of the approaches that people have been taking to address the translational challenges and fill the gap of lost in translation is use of biomarkers. Look at the precision medicines. Target the subclass of the subtype of diseases in the heterogeneous population that we are all in. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your uh, wonderful, wonderful talk about uh, this enlightening the translational roadblocks. We'll just take a few questions from the audience if they have, uh, mm -hmm. and then we'll move on. Yeah, sure. To the audience, uh, any questions? If anyone has, please ask uh, on the mic, or you can also send on the chat box. I would uh, recite it to the uh, uh, Dr. Satigiri. So by the time uh, the audience uh, take their time, I may, I may, uh, can I ask one question from my side? Please. Like, uh, the finding a biomarker is a major challenge as we uh, face in discovery and further in clinical development also. So first thing is to select a biomarker for any particular disease or which is related to a particular target. So uh, although we have explored this in industry, like we, you, we keep doing it either in industry and academia, but like, what are the things that we need to keep in mind when we are selecting a biomarker for any particular disease? I think one of the most foremost important thing is that it has to be relevant to the disease that we are trying to target. It has okay. to be reliable. It has to be robust and it should be reproducible. I think that these are the in a very high level, most important things when you're looking at a biomarker. Because it should not happen that you develop something and then eventually you realize that the sensitivity and the specificity, what we are talking is less than as high as possible is the best, but it should not be less than I think. I just think that less than 99 or 98 percent will not be meaningful. All right, right. Thank you. Any any other questions from anybody in the audience? Uh, there is a question from Dr. Pratima. She is our uh, faculty here. And uh, she has asked a question that uh, can a biomarker reduce the steps and complications involved in clinical trials? It doesn't reduce the steps or the complication. It just helps in the patient selection and the strat uh, stratification. And helps in by doing that, it helps you in improving your success rates. You are in a better state to predict who can be benefit more from use of this particular uh, therapy. That will be the advantage, but you will have to go through the whole gamut of uh, drug development. What you will benefit is a reduced risk of failure. Right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. We have another question from another audience, uh, Sayyad Akhtar Imam. Uh, his question is, can we use EZFR as a biomarker in oral squamous cell carcinoma detection? I don't know the specific answer, but it would depend depend if it is in overexpression in particular cell type, uh, cancer type, right? Yes, yes. 
uh, we have Dr. Sandeep here. He is a faculty in medicinal chemistry. He has one question. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, sir, for the very informative talk. And uh, we de definitely benefited from your uh, perspectives. Uh, I don't have a specific questions, but I, I, as a medicinal chemist, since you had been also uh, trained as a medicinal chemist during your early life, and we have several young medicinal chemists right now sitting in the seminar room in the Naipur Rivalry campus, I would like to uh, uh, re request you that please give some uh, remarks to the young medicinal chemist uh, for their career in uh, such uh, uh, as you have developed. So <laughs> you're putting me, me in a spot now. I think uh, you are uh, well, uh, you can advise, but OK, let me share my experience. Yeah, that, that's actually company perspectives to, yeah, to the young yeah. people. That is yeah. more important for us. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, Although I referred to the translational challenges when we talk of the drug development, but I think we need to remember that such translational challenges are inbuilt even when we talk of drug discovery and that medicinal, as medicinal chemists, it is our responsibility to see that we, we integrate all the information that comes either from the biology side, the DMPK side, the PK, the efficacy, how do we look at that information? Why a drug which was, which showed very potent activity in the cell-based assays or enzyme-based activities is not showing a required in vivo efficacy. And even to go back a step further, a step back, sometimes we see, and it's very common that we see very potent compounds in the enzyme activity, but we are not able to translate into the cell-based activity. So what is happening? Why certain drugs which are appear to be very good, but in DMPK they fail, they are not stable, they do not have permeability, they do not have good PK. So I think it is very important to look at all the data that comes in from different sources, study them properly, and look at the literature as to what are the different strategies people have used to improve on those particular properties. like. For example, if you have found that your compound is very, very unstable metabolically. I mean, you need to look back and see, can you identify what would be the very unstable points in your molecule? Can you block them? Can you make them stable? Right. If they are not showing per required permeability, what is the log P values? What is the chem informatics telling you? Modify the physicochemical properties of the molecule to improve upon the permeability and then solubility is another problem that we generally face. So I think it is very important for us not to take this data lying down, but be very, very upfront and try to integrate into our next designs. So as it applies to the clinical research or the translational research, the iterative process, the collaboration, is a must. Without that, I don't think we can make any progress here in the even the medicinal chemistry that we are talking about. That would be my simple uh, advice and the suggestion to the young chemists. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, so just request you, your screen setting is still on. Can can we okay. put it off? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'll put it off. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So any other questions from anybody? Yeah, I have a question actually. Uh, Dr. Ravinder, he is a faculty in pharmacology. He has one question to you. Good morning, sir, actually. Hi. Your talk was very, very encouraging actually. So as you rightly pointed out in your talk, actually the individualization of the drug or personalization of the drug is the need of our, especially for uh, like this in the cancer or anti-cancer drug actually. So we know like there are many success stories, like in journal these uh, trials failed, but when they go for individualization, right? In a particular subset of these patient, actually, then we have a success in the clinical trials, actually. So I was wondering, like, how we can inculcate this kind of practices in very early on in the preclinical um, discovery or the preclinical drug screening? Is there, what is your view on that, actually? See, one way to do is to have, right from the beginning, a strong collaboration with the teams who are involved in the clinical research. 
to have an open discussion with when you are doing a research in the in the discovery stage you are particularly choosing certain targets certain disease areas to collaborate with those teams who are actually involved in the clinical research and understand what are the challenges there and can you bring some of those understanding into your uh, early stage of research itself instead of acting in a isolated manner or oh, i want to work on this target and not knowing what is happening outside or has happened and keep developing a molecule and then realize that oh this is already not going to work because this is not relevant to the disease actually that we are targeting so again the collaboration and the iterative process is the most important thing right thanks. from the beginning right you are talking about yeah thanks thank you so thanks a lot uh, for sharing your uh, experience knowledge and wisdom with us and our students and enriching the thought of audiences uh, not only at naipur library but the faculties and the students across the country who have joined this symposium uh, th thank you sir so uh, i will get back to you and uh, will talk to you further on this uh, on if they if any any of the audience have any questions i will ask them sure. to reach to you sure. Sure. thank you Thank so, you. Bye bye. Moving so. on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Anurag Basne, who is Vice President at Patanjali Research Institute. Uh, I am happy to share, and since he is uh, present over here well, virtually, I would like to thank him because uh, Patanjali Research Institute is also the sponsorship for our all silver and gold medals of the toppers of the institute. So a big round of applause for him. Uh, to introduce Dr. Nag Varsne, who is the next speaker for the day, I would invite Dr. Ravinder to introduce to the audience, and uh, then we'll go ahead with his talk. Hi, good morning, everyone. I am uh, very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Anurag Vashne, an eminent expert in the field of tech discovery and development. Uh, he's a PhD from uh, NCBS uh, Bangalore and a postdoc from uh, Yale School of Medicine, USA. Currently, he's leading um, Patanjali Research Institute as vice president of Drug Discovery and Development Division. Prior to joining Patanjali Research Institute, he has worked in various at various capacities in several multinational organizations such as uh, Marine Biological uh, Laboratories, Daiichi Sanku, uh, Renovaxi Research Lab, and many more. He is a visionary thinker and a natural accelerator of science. I'm sure, like by this time, actually we have all heard about Corona. Uh, uh, it was uh, one of the main topic actually during of discussion during the pandemic. And uh, today, actually, Dr. Anurag Washne is going to tell us the story from uh, idea to its uh, uh, release into the clinic, actually. And uh, now, without taking much time, I'm no, I know like you all must be very, very eager actually to hear this uh, success story. I invite Dr. Vashne to deliver his talk entitled From Idea Board to Drug Accord. Coronel hit the right spot. So over to you, Dr. Anurag Vashne. Thank you very much. Uh, just I want to confirm whether I'm audible to you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Fanta. That's fantastic. So uh, thank you very much, Naipa. Thank you very much, Professor Murthy, uh, Dr. Rakesh, and the whole team over there for uh, inviting me to uh, talk about a bit of uh, the science that we do here at Patanjali Research Institute. And I was very much uh, engaged from the introductory comments from Professor Murthy, where he talked about where the uh, Indian science is moving in the field of uh, pharmacology education, training, and for the development and grooming of the students towards a future success. And since we talk about the translational challenges and how things can be translated from an early spark to a final product, so I thought this would be a nice opportunity to talk about Coronel. And uh, since now I work for an herbal drug company where we try to see the uh, mode of action for most of the drugs that we work with, I thought uh, this would be slightly different uh, than what has been very uh, elegantly explained by Dr. Jitendra Satyagri, where he made very sure about the how does the drug move in case of allopathic synthetic drugs from one point to another and what are the challenges. 
here to now I will talk about herbal drugs. How do we start from beginning and what are the various parameters we can look into it? What are the challenges and how Patanjali Research Institute uh, strategize to actually clear out those challenges? So with this, I will try to start my presentation and let me know if you can see it. Now, is it visible to you? Yes, sir. Can you see my slide that says from idea board to the drug accord? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Fantastic. So uh, that's a title that uh, we chose and um, my uh, team here try to be slightly more, more poetic and they start to have a word which sound uh, similar in the end. So I thank them is Dr. Swati Halder, who's our head of uh, microbiology and, and she suggested this slightly fancy target. Now, uh, since uh, I'm going to talk about the research that we do here at PRI, uh, and th this is a relatively newer institute, it's like just four and a half year old. So I thought uh, it would be ideal to introduce the research institute where we work, since it's uh, it, it it has the capabilities where we are trying to drive the excellence in the field of Ayurvedic research. So in next few slides, maybe four or five, I will just try to give you a bit of the glimpse of the capability what PRI has. So PRI, which we call Patanjali Research Institute, is blessed by Param Sraddhya Swamiji and Param Pooja Acharji, and uh, they are visible on your screen, and I'm sure they don't need any introduction from me. So the, the, the aim for what the whole center has been set up is to actually improve the health and the quality of life through research and innovation, and that has been the core of the existence of PRI. And uh, this is a building of PRI, which is in Haridwar, which was inaugurated by our Honorable Prime Minister of uh, Sri Modi ji in 2017. And uh, uh, it has been functioning since uh, till then. And these are the few glimpses from the laboratory area where we have uh, the Prime Minister visiting and few other dignitaries on different times. So let's come to the uh, the vision that we have for PRI. Uh, am I there? Hello. Yes, 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 Dr. Vash. Can you hear me? I don't see myself. Yes, yes, Dr. Vash. Good. You are audible so, and uh, right up here. Fantastic. So the present slide that shows the vision for PRI. So the idea behind setting up the PRI by Patanjali conglomerate was to actually process the unstructural Ayurvedic and herbal information through a scientific method and where we combine the rich history, old wisdom, uh, jointed with the modern practices, go for the multi-pronged approach. Few of those approaches have been already underlined by Dr. Jitendra Satyagri and uh, develop something which would be called as research Ayurveda. The final target are, was to actually have a scientifically validated evidence based medicinal system. And we would have eventually a well characterized Ayurvedic herbal medicines. So the strategy has been to set up into the four different part. First was to initiate, which was actually based on the uh, information from Dibya Pharmacy, which is the manufacturing site for most of the drugs that we have here at Patanjali. And uh, we had a visionary leadership of Acharji and Swamiji and the wisdom that is there in our ancient books. So we uh, started from there, transited towards no on noble processes, look for the drugs which are patented by Patanjali and try to set up a world class infrastructure. We actualized it by hiring energized workforce, got some ignited thoughts to move forward and started to deliver the quality. And we are aiming towards excellence, which would be actually a universal acceptance of Ayurveda. So this slide shows the research strength and the accreditations at Patanjali Research Institute. So since this is a new institute, so all the regulatory requirements have been fulfilled and some of them have been even exceeded from the requirement for conducting Ay Ayurvedic medicinal research. So we have three laboratories with NABL accreditations with a dedicated quality assurance compliance. Our labs are accredited by DSIR from uh, uh, CERO. We have close to 300 scientists working here at Patanjali Research Institute. There are several PhDs and several postdocs with global experiences. We have a full-fledged registered animal house as per CPC requirement, which is governed by Institutional Animal Ethics Committee. 
Our laboratories are in compliance with Biosafety Label 2, which are governed by Institutional Biosafety Committee, and it has a dedicated clean and service corridor for microbiology and in the experimental animal facility. We do have Institutional Ethics Committee for human clinical trials, and most of our studies are not actually most. All of our studies are now registered with CTRI, which is Clinical Trial Registry of India. In addition, we have 180 bed Ayurvedic uh, hospital in, uh, in our campus, which is accredited by NABH. We have an approved Ayurvedic medical college with PG approvals in eight subjects. On Patanjali roster, there are close to 1,500 medical doctors across the India, and daily footfall of 15,000 patients across India happens over there. So there is a team of uh, IT pro professionals who actually manages the data from 15,000 page patients on a daily basis. Right now, if I look at those numbers, the total number of patients which are there in this EMR, electronic medical record, we call as PEMR, that means Patanjali electronic medical record, they are close to one crore patients there which have been collected for last several decades. So in total, what we call the diversified research framework at Patanjali. Now, if you look at the Patanjali Research Institute, it is governed by Patanjali Research Foundation Trust, and it has five major sections. First is the herbal research, where we do the research and documentation on pure herbs, and we, uh, the, the bigger work going over there to actually compile the information which is present there across the world, and we call the World Herbal Encyclopedia, and close to one lakh herbal plants are being listed in that huge compendium. Second team is drug discovery and development, where we do our basic research, in the wet lab research, and also clinical research under uh, the umbrella of drug discovery and development. Then we have uh, plant paintings and herbarium. Our herbarium is accredited by uh, New York Herbarium, and we do issue the uh, stamps for most of the plants that come for our herbarium. We have a section that take care of ancient documents, the old manuscripts which are written on uh, on metal pieces, on plant leaves, and those manuscripts are, are actually being processed here and, and have been uh, digitized to save it for future. Close to nine lakh sheets have been now digitized and has been converted into a large compendium too. And last but not, not the least, we have a yoga research where the uh, research is conducted on the various part of yoga practice and its impact on human body. In addition to these five, we have four more core uh, support system which are in a uh, different part of Patanjali. So we have a Patanjali Organic Research Institute. We have central labs at Patanjali Ayurveda Limited, which is the site for the manufacturing. And we have new product development team at Divya Pharmacy. And we have Patanjali Hospital and Medical College right there. So in total, total nine, these segments contribute towards the basic research and advanced research that we conducted PRI. So let's come to drug discovery and development. So drug discovery and development has four major departments, microbiology, chemistry, which is herbal chemistry, in vitro biology, and in, in vivo biology. And these are the glimpses of our infrastructure. I invite most of you, if you could take some time to come to Haridwar and pay us a visit and see the type of investment that we're doing, the type of facility that we have, where we're trying to deliver the science at a global level. So most of the technologies required for conducting research, either it's in Medical chemistry, in vitro biological research, or animal research, they are here available in house. In addition, we also outsource some of our work to different CROs and also collaborate with different institutions. A couple of our experiments has also been done at Naipur Gohati. So let's look into it, what kind of work we do. So we have a different approaches for uh, dealing with the problem. One of the approaches to looking at different formulation types. That means in Ayurveda, we have uh, either tablets, we have uh, asabs, aristas, uh, quads, and different uh, formulations. One way is to dealing with them and try to find out uh, which form does better job. And the second one is to look for uh, disease and try to find out if you can uh, research on the basis of, of, of a disease. In starting, in starting off the meeting today, uh, Professor Murthy explained that uh, understanding a disease biology is very important, and the same thing applies here as well. So we, our team here, 
works on various disease biologies we try to understand uh, in depth and try to figure it out that which component could be uh, tweaked by the herbal interventions so our core areas that we are working right now are inflammation metabolic diseases neuroscience and infectious diseases and uh, in the bands that you see the name of the disease where we have been working and the numbers at the end of the band tells the number of test articles that we have been dealing with so close to uh, 100 plus articles that we have been working and trying to figure it out that which might work slightly better in terms of the efficacy that we look in the patients so now we move towards what i'm going to talk about so so far has been introduction and i took slightly longer and i did it deliberately because most of the uh, people outside haridwar uh, generally uh, are not much uh, aware about the capabilities that we have and the work that we are, are doing so i thought it would be uh, a nice platform to actually explain the type of work we are putting it on so from now onwards there are going to be lots of data coming up and i might have to go through rather quickly so all the students who are there in the audience i request them to have your paper and pen and if you have a query write it down and at the end we will deal with with, with those so uh, we work on different ayurvedic medicinal product for human diseases and there are different area as i talked about and the hero of the story today is coronel which has been uh, has been the talk of the town for quite a while but today i will explain to you how we started and where we reached and what kind of experiment we did what kind of challenges we faced and how do we deal how do we dealt with them and in the end most of the work that we did with coronel has been published and i i will also try to share some of them some of those publications in this presentation today in addition to coronel we have been working on other new formulations too some of them are shown on the right hand side of the slide there is there is a drug called uh, levomerate levograt bpgrate orthograt madugrat imunograt different series ha has been now launched and the patanjali research institute has played a, a significant role in getting these medicines toward the stage what they are right now so coronel against covid-19 at a glance is a very busy slide but i just want to say that the whole work started sometime in the end of 2019 or early 2020 and uh, in a span of a year a lot of work was done and most of things are listed here as a timeline but i will try to take you some of them in details in our, our upcoming slides so when the covid thing started the the bigger challenge was to find out which are the drugs from herbal uh, history can be used against it and since it was a newer disease not much was known about it so uh, the team here at patanjali research institute has very uh, gifted uh, molecular modelers who were uh, very curious to try uh, different components from from several plants so in january itself we tried close to 120 different plants and out of those 120 plant we have 1500 compounds and they were quickly docked into the cluster structure of sars-cov-2 virus spike protein available at that moment of time and its interaction with the human as2 uh, protein which is the binding partner for the same and uh, also the different other uh, proteins which are there inside uh, the covid virus so what we found we actually screened a lot we we kind of listed them out as per the binding efficiencies binding energies and we found that one compound from ashwagandha bidania somnifera a compound named bidinone that binds very well at that interaction of spike protein with a2 and another compound from giloy tinospora cardifolia the compound is tinocorticide also did the pretty much same and third compound that we could find called escaltrine that came from osimum sanctum tulsi and that was binding very well at uh, the uh, rdrp enzyme which is important for viral replication so uh, we then thought okay, okay let's take this forward and this is the first thing we have can we now do some wet lab experiment and try to figure it out this computational finding really holds true or not so we did our first experiment with the basic biochemistry where the team could actually get hold of the spike protein uh, the purified protein uh, the 
receptor binding domain of spike protein was taken up. ACE2 protein was also commercially available and a basic sandwich ELISA could be done. And as you can see on the screen, let me get some pointer there if, I, if that's possible. Here. So uh, this is the receptor binding domain from spike protein and this is ACE2 from human host site and bidinone, which is a compound from ashwagandha, so it's supposed to bind it here and break this interaction. And this is the basic biochemistry to drive the ELISA behind it. So we found that if we did this and we set up this biochemical measurement, we found that bidinone in this given concentration inhibited this interaction in a dose dependent manner fully with the IC50 of close to 0.4 nanogram per mm, uh, nanogram per microliter. So uh, then we thought, okay, that's fantastic. So that that at least computational binding experiment shows some biochemical confirmation. So then the this task was transferred towards some uh, herbal chemist and we asked them that can they generate an enriched extract of ashwagandha, which would be enriched with Withenone alone because withenone generally is very less in ashwagandha extracts. So the team worked hard there and they could actually come down with an extract that has close to 70% uh, withenone presented. And what you see on your screen on the right hand side is an HPC spectra with, a, with a, the blue line is actually the known purified compound. And this peak here is coming from the ashwagandha enriched extract, suggesting that that the major compound in that extract was within all. So we took this further and tried to find out can we do a, a, some better biological experiments or some experiment in the animals. So uh, we then moved towards doing an animal experimentations. We developed uh, zebrafish models. I will explain the zebrafish models in my subsequent slides slightly better. But right now I want you to hold this thought with you that uh, uh, an humanized zebrafish model was developed where this enriched extract of, of ashwagandha was tested and we could find that it does has an, uh, an efficacy to rescue the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein induced inflammation in these humanized zebrafish model. So of course published in drug design development and therapy at that time. Similar thing was done for Giloy uh, uh, post Ashwagandha, we moved towards Giloy and we tried to do a similar experiment. The team chemistry could actually quickly uh, verify, certify, and validate that the extract that we were dealing with from the Giloy has a few specific compounds with which we could actually uh, set them as in markers for the extract from time to time and batch to batch. So those four markers were isol isolated, purified, and actually uh, defined as an QC uh, parameter. They were cardiac folicide, magnofluorine, beta agdisone, and palmitine. And uh, these one then further also taken the similar animal model that I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain a bit later. Uh, and it, it also shows a good efficacy and it also affects the different level of inflammation. So we could see that Giloidhanbati, which is an uh, enriched extract uh, tablet from uh, Giloy extract could rescue from SARS-CoV-2 spike protein induced inflammation. And this was published later in Frontiers in Pharmacology. So uh, these three, and we had a similar finding from Tulsi as well, which were done in a different manner. So then the thought comes, how about we combine these three selected plants and get in the form of a single tablet, because that will have a better patient compliance. Uh, patients or people may not want to have multiple tablets at the same time. And again, the dosing thing becomes uh, slightly more painful. So in order to get a better compliance, these three were mixed together and that's how the coronal tablet was generated. So coronal is basically nothing, just these three plant extract, which have been classically described in Ayurveda for several centuries ago. So once we get the coronal, then we have to uh, confirm that it has all the required compounds and the chemistry of uh, this medicine is, is actually clear and we could validate it so that they would be least best to which variants. So the analytical chemistry team went back and they did a lot of detailed HPTLC experiment and could actually set up the chemical signature for the same compound. Similarly, uh, on HPLC, 
same thing was also done. And then we moved towards LCMS and could find out what are the main compounds which are present throughout. Total 52 compounds were, sorry, 44 compounds were reported in uh, LCMS in uh, coronal and which were validated later by HPLC as well. So all of this analytical chemistry validation of coronal has also been published in Journal of Separation Science. And I'm very happy to show that uh, this work was actually selected by the journal for a cover page image. And I think uh, coronal is the first Ayurvedic medicine that came to a front page or a cover page of a, any journal of a sizable impact factor. And our whole chemistry team takes a big proud of that. And before we start doing a biology as well, the thought was just to get uh, uh, toxicity of this drug also tested. So we did GLP tox of coronal in rats and rabbits. And uh, what you're seeing right now is the data from the rat study, where we did for 28 day uh, up to 1000 milligram per kg dose of coronal uh, with the recovery group as well. And uh, we did not observe any adverse effect in any of the toxicological parameters which were uh, listed as per OECD guideline. This study was conducted at a, at a CRO site in a blinded manner. The team CRO didn't even know that they were dealing with code. They were sent the uh, coded compound, they generated the report, and then they shared with us. So NOEL for coronal in this study was just to be 1000 milligram per kg per day. And there the, uh, we did a detailed histopathology as well because there was some thoughts that these her herbal drugs taken for longer time might have some impact on uh, some uh, different uh, organs. Some of them have been talking about a uh, kidney, lungs and liver. So we, we chose to uh, list it out almost all the organs which are there and did a detailed histopathology. And again, in most of the histopathological markers, there was no adverse effect that was seen has been published last month in drug and chemical toxicology and uh, uh, the rabbit study is right now under final review. So so far for coronal, we talked about the chemical uh, validation, uh, safety, and let's move towards biology and try to look at the scientific evidences of coronal as a supporting manager in COVID-19. And uh, the claim for supporting manager in COVID-19 has been awarded by Ministry of Higher the Government of India. So earlier we talked about uh, the biochemical validations uh, when we looked for the compound within on from ashwagandha the same assay was actually applied here and we'll be tested for coronal now uh, here we try to go for uh, two or three level more so at that time when we were doing this experiment there was uh, only one variant of spike protein was known later as we all know covid virus chose to mutate and we got several more mutations so at that time, three major mutations were available commercially. So we procure all three of them and we try to see if you take these three mutants and try to interact that with the ACE2, the human ACE2, does that interaction be blocked by coronal in a dose dependent manner? And the answer is yes. All three of these mutations, what we call this wild type, is not really wild type, it's a one um, mutation. Later, these two mutations were also reported, and in all three cases, coronal inhibited these interactions in a dose-dependent manner. And second parameter, which become very challenging, because that time the demand was to see something that can control the cytokine surge as well, the cytokine, cytokine storm that we talk about. It. So we then we chose, uh, because that was one of the challenges that we need to deal with. So we chose that if we take these spike protein and we hit them on A549 cells, which are human uh, alveolar uh, epithelial cells, and do an ELISA for the three major cytokines, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, and IL-1-beta, and see if any of these three get kicked up by the spike proteins. And if it is, then can we come with coronal different treatments and can reduce the expression, uh, can we reduce the release of these spike proteins? So, uh, sorry, uh, release the cytokine. Excuse me, something is missing. Can we control the release of these cytokines? So, we found that out of three mutants that we have, the one which is D614G did not induce any cytokine release. And later it, it turned out to, that even in the clinical setting, that mutant was not inducing huge cytokine surge. 
However, the wild type and W436R induced a significant amount of cytokines. Uh, W36R was slightly lesser for IL-1 beta, but it secreted pretty well TNF alpha and IL-6. So this is a basic cell biology experiment which was done in the uh, in vitro biology lab here. And when we treated these uh, upregulated TNF alpha IL-6 or IL-1 beta from A549 cells with coronal, coronal could actually block that release in a concentration dependent manner and which you can see in these uh, bar charts in front of you. Now comes uh, the another bigger point that uh, if the virus is the primary cause of the disease, of course, as everyone know it, and the earlier data we were showing about the spike protein only. So what happens if we take the whole virus? Can we work upon it and see if coronal can do something about it? And that's a, one of the challenges that we faced. Uh, it, we faced for a long time because we tried to get hold of the COVID virus for the experimental purposes, and we couldn't get it. Mm -hmm. Our laboratory area was BSL two. We upgraded uh, for BSL three. We developed that facility. We uh, structurally made a BSL three facility for handling COVID virus. However, the, the approvals from government, it took time, so we could not do it here. And at, at uh, third party also, it was not possible to be done at that time. These were during like uh, May, June 2020, where it was very hard to get things done. So then the thought came, then uh, one of our team member, Dr. Swati Haldar, she collaborated with uh, one group in Germany, uh, Professor Polman, who has developed a pseudo virus for SARS-CoV-2, where the coat protein of uh, of another virus was actually having the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2, so it becomes a non-infective virus per se. It well, it it becomes infective in nature, but it does not multiply inside the host cell. So there was like a whole protocol of generating those pseudo viruses. It, it goes through three different cell lines, and we have to pack multiple. Uh, biotechnological components within a virus and into the cell and but eventually at the end of the day well it, our team it could generate in nature the, but it does not to pseudo type multiply virus here at the, the host cell. research institute so there was like and once whole those viruses are generating, generating they those pseudo viruses two, it, it goes through the three type different cell lines we were in we have to do it multiple the first one of course were biotechnological cytokine components within the virus and in virus which has the whole eventually at the end of the day our team could generate in nature but it does not Three of them multiplied by CIA and the other side. So there was an endless protocol of generating those virus. It goes through the three different cell lines. We were in the BSL two. The bigger challenge is that the virus could be easily looked at the whole and the virus side of the whole and 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 the whole the uh, first one out for the virus and the virus is looking at the whole ray of the virus and the red of the whole and the spike the day and there you will be the general case of the virus but it does not have the whole ray of the virus and the virus is looking at the whole ray of the virus and the virus is looking at the whole ray of the virus and the virus is looking at the whole ray of the virus and the virus is looking at the whole ray of the virus and the virus is looking at the whole ray of the virus and the virus is looking at the whole ray of the virus and the virus is looking at the whole ray of the virus and the virus is looking at the whole ray of the virus and the virus is looking at the whole ray of the virus and the virus is looking at the whole ray of the virus and the virus is looking at and I so we have to do 
and in in uh, all three of these parameter core will put also inhibit in a dose dependent manner so now comes the model that i was talking i was going to talk about so uh, this is one of the transnational challenge that we dealt with that uh, we need to show some in vivo proof of concept for the uh, for the test article that we had with us and we were dealing with SARS-CoV-2 virus and SARS-CoV-2 virus doesn't really infect uh, rat or mice which which are the generally model that we work with so then it become a challenge that how are we going to test it so uh, one of our CRO partner was very kind enough to actually uh, work with us and we could develop those model where we took zebra fish and we actually uh, transplanted human alveolar epithelial cells, the same A5 phone and cells that we talked about in the swim bladder of the fish. Now here there are two challenges that we have to deal with. First, the primary organ for SARS-CoV-2 is actually, what was at that time was actually lung. So we need to have an, a lung-like tissue or lung-like organ in the fish, but fish doesn't have lung. So we have to find the, where we could do this. And apparently it so happened that fish has something called uh, a sac that, we, that is called swim bladder, where the air is filled and that helps a fish to actually stay afloat or go deep in the water. So the swim bladder is an air sac naturally present inside the zebra fish. So we took the A549 cells and transplanted these cells in the swim bladder of the fish. And we waited for seven days and, and opened up some fishes and to find out whether the transplantation happened. And on the center of this slide, you see these circles. These are the A509 cells which have, which have homed in inside the swim bladder of the fish. And once this happened, then we, we, we could actually inject the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 in the same area, and then we could measure the hallmark of different sort of inflammation in this xenotransplanted humanized zebra fish. One of them was the hemorrhage, second was the fever, and third was looking for different migration or different infiltration of, of uh, immunogenic cells right at the site of injury. And the second challenge that came that when we're talking about fever, so fish is actually a cold blooded animal. It won't have a changes in the fever. So how would you measure it if you want to show some correlation with the human phenotype? So there uh, the new design was set up and that is called behavioral fever, where you look at the behavior of a fish. So what fish choose to do, it actually choose to spend more time in a temperatured water, which is close to its body temperature. So that becomes an easy measurement of a potential temperature of a fish. So there was a, uh, a box was designed which has three different temperatures, as you can see here. And one side is cooler to maintain the temperature and one side is warmer and three temperature was maintained 23 degrees Celsius, 29 degrees Celsius and 37 degrees Celsius. And fish was introduced here. There were holes in between so fish can swim across and can go either of these temperature boxes depending upon the temperature of the body of the fish. And then these, these boxes were videographed for 180 seconds and we found the total amount of time spent by a fish at a given box. And that time get plotted here. So if disease condition happened, most of the fish spend time at 37 degrees Celsius Normally they are at 29 degrees Celsius. And when we fed these fish with the extracts or with the coronal fused with their diet, 
these fish then move more towards same temperature and that you can quantify it here the two do doses of coronal was given which were human equivalent doses this is the human dose of coronal this is one do this is one third dose lesser and we could then find the coronal actually controlled these phenotype in a dose dependent manner as well and we could look for different uh, spike protein induced inflammation we look for various markers i don't want to go too much on detail because it might then overshoot my time but these studies had been published in molecules with that time we have to quickly publish that so we chose this journal which could process very quickly it was published in i think november 2020 and most of these data there and this is again an open access article people if you want to go and see it is e easily available to everyone and then we moved towards clinical trials so clinical trials were actually going in, in parallel uh, we did it uh, with the nims university in jaipur under the leadership of professor bs somar and the trials were registered with the ctri and later they have been picked up by who international clinical trial registry platform and the trial information from that website have been pasted it here so here in this trial what we did we actually worked on the components of coronal as such and in parallel we also give swasai which is one more medication which i'm not talking today and nasal drop of alutela was given for those patients so the experiments were a pretty straight forward where we give a uh, ayurvedic treatment to the patients who were covid positive who were declared covid positive by rt pcr but they didn't have a uh, few symptoms they were they were having very mild symptom of, of the disease at that moment of time and other people were just giving placebo and they were hospitalized in uh, nims hospital uh, which is under nims university in jaipur and various parameters were done and the output was this that if we look for uh, the recovery frequency which is the testing negative in rt pcr analysis the people who are getting negative after being detected positive for 3 days and 7 days and if you see on this graph the uh, orange one are the placebo group and the green ones are the treatment group at at the end of seventh day almost all the people 50 of those they become all covid negative who were as a part of the treatment group it was a double blind trials the patient or the doctor was not uh, aware of those those uh, treatment conditions and the medicine that they were given we could also analyze it further but it it just shows that compared to placebo group the rate of recovery in the, in the patients were faster in the group treated with ayurvedic medications in these patients we also look for serum crp level which is a marker of in inflammation and we could see that in these patient who were a part of treatment group they had 12 point almost 13 times lesser crp levels than the patient who were in placebo group we also measured tnf alpha in the serum of these patients and we could see the tnf alpha level was also reduced in the treatment group uh, patients these studies was published in phyto medicines uh, and uh, it it was actually pretty well received and we have got lots of good comments and sometimes not so good comments too but that that was a good part of science right so we also did the similar kind of experiment uh, or studies at various site across india one of the site in ahmedabad conducted the same thing as a part of uh, not like a clinicalist trial study but it's like a case study where in the uh, covid care centers these medications were given and we also look for the rate of recovery where the uh, medicines were given with allopathic medicines or just ayurvedic medicines and we could show that uh, ayurvedic medicines has an impact on asymptomatic mild symptomatic covid-19 patients that was also published in journal of herbal medicine now uh, once we show that there is a in vitro proof of concept there is a in vivo proof of concept and we could show a clinical efficacy too then then the thought comes that what is the impact of these medications on the quality of life or patient declared uh, uh, treatment benefits so that was a public health related work was done from the clinical research team at patanjali research institute and there they could actually do an, a good experiment of close to uh, 367 patients or who were actually taking coronal kit 
and they they measured the treatment satisfaction and also the the psychological impact and the quality of life of of those uh, patients too and it correlated very well the treatment satisfaction was higher the stress level was lower and the quality of life was better in in, in the patients who were taking coronel we also chose to publish in patient preference and ad adherence a bit later so this is the latest data because uh, there was uh, we i mean few months before there was a lot of noise and uh, uh, discussion about omicron so we also got the spike protein from omicron variant and did a basic biochemistry experiment and we found that coronel also inhibited the interaction of spike thing to me so carefully and i hope i didn't run through very quickly but if there are questions i'll be very happy to take it but before that i would like to thank my whole team at pri the team at patanjali yogpeet at the bay pharmacy at patanjali ayurved limited and also at national institute of medical sciences names in jaipur thank you very much indeed thank you dr washlet for sharing your experiences and uh, success story about the coronil for the development of the coronil by patanjali research institute indeed it was an exciting story and a wonderful piece of work by uh, your organizations if any question from the audience actually uh, feel free to ask dr washlet Uh, so dr washney i have some question from one of our student actually junaid akhtar his question is actually what are the other cell line that can be used to study the effect of coronel um, secondly apart from uh, zebrafish uh, were any other animal model was also involved in the study uh, now uh, we are working on uh, uh, hamsters chinese hamsters because that model is now available for a covid virus research and those experiment have been also completed and we do see some good uh, efficacy in those disease model too and in terms of cell line other than uh, fi49 one could also use uh, calu2 cell lines which are pretty good too which are also from the lung origin and we did some experiment with bs2b cell line too which are the uh, bronchial epithelial cells so uh, if we have uh, those uh, in vitro disease models they can be explored there any other question no good afternoon sir hello vedant can you introduce yourself and you can ask your question yes so myself vedant deshmukh i am neurochemist from department of medicine and chemistry now i would like to ask one question sir as undoubtedly india has the treasure of the medicines regarding herbal case but when we think about herbal medicines we have we come across with some problems like natural products mainly have high molecular weight secondly they have multi step synthesis and when we say that multi step synthesis synthesis is there the yield that we get finally that is very less so i want to ask how these challenges or how these problems have been over, overcome in case of this uh, osmum sanctum or in case of gilo as well i think i would request if you could repeat your last line again yes sir i was asking that when we used to synthesis natural products we have some problems in case when we think about natural products first one is the molecular weight that they have very high molecular weight secondly the multi step synthesis when we think about multi step synthesis the final yield that we are thinking that will get very less and when that uh, that yield is very less bioavailability will also get affected so i want to ask how these challenges have been overcome in order to synthesis like uh, osmum sanctum and hold this giloy formulation so here i think uh, uh, i would like to say that you don't need to synthesize those when they are available to you naturally and in not very expensive way then why not uh, purify or enrich them from the natural sources so at patanjali we do not use synthetics we actually take uh, the raw material which is there in uh, from nature and we extract that and use it as a medicine so the, all the data that you saw today they are from the natural extracts they are not synthetic okay thank you <clears throat> uh, dr washney we have uh, another one question uh, sorry dr yeah, nidhi have... yeah it's yep, okay it's okay please carry on 
No, no, please go ahead. Ask the question. OK, uh, thank you, Dr. Vashnil. It was a very nice presentation. And congratulations that uh, at least you have succeeded for the uh, preparation of this herbal drug. And uh, I have one more query regarding that. Ki, as we have used three important extract um, in this area, like uh, Tulsi, you have used Giloe, and uh, another one that was the uh, third one. I missed it. Ashwagandha. Ashwagandha. Yeah, Ashwagandha. Uh, these all things are uh, well, well known. Naturally, we uh, generally we use in uh, regular routine that uh, Ashwagandha is good for all these things. So have you find out because you are using the uh, uh, extract of these three important materials. So that was not specified for the particular uh, molecules. OK, so have you find out ki that might be that these three important mixtures in their combined form might be introducing some other structures because of their poor counter current uh, interactions with each other. So have you find out ki what is that novel structure? That is only why it is reacting with the exportings of that uh, coronavirus. Because when we are using separately, then there is because separately we used to do these all things for the natural different type of the other diseases also, right? But when we are combinedly up to that particular concentration of that drug, whatever you have designed, especially in this COVID case, might be showing some different structure because so many things, they are interrelated with each other. And in that formulations, is it uh, studied by you that what novelty is there? Or it was just making a herbal tablet and uh, it has been uh, tested for the against of the uh, exporters? Uh, Ma'am, I think uh, uh, I would like to say so that uh, we did a very detailed chemical characterization of this tablet, which has all three of that, them together. That uh, and, is okay. uh, the L and the LCMS picks up total 44 compounds which are present there. And we could actually yeah. assign close to uh, 39 out of those 44 to the three main components that we have. Out of those, uh, close to five compounds were unreported ever. So we don't know whether they are newly coming up or they are there naturally. Our thought is that they are present naturally and we are detecting all of them together. So it is a combination. And as I, as I also said, it is not just a normal extract. These are the enriched extract by, uh, by going a process of herbal chemistry, which has the compounds of our interest at that specific point. So it is just not like taking ashwagandha, galoya, tulsi and mix together, take an extract and make a tablet. No. All three of them were done independently to enrich the fraction that we are more interested in, where we could see a sizable biology. Okay. But it was a good question, and thank you. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Vashni, we have uh, one question from one of our participants. Actually, the question is, was coronal compared with any other herbal or synthetic drug uh, during the clinical trial or in the preclinical studies? So what would you like to compare with? At the time, there was no drug available. Right. Uh, so I hope actually, Rachna, you got your answer actually, uh, because at that time, no other drug was available to for the comparison purpose. So that's why actually there was just nothing actually to compare. Uh, Dr. Pratima, uh, she also had a question actually, has the effect of coronal studied on the gut microbiota? And oh, also yes. The oh, yes. Oh, yes. That's a good and question. That was a one piece of data I, I I didn't show, but yes, it does has a good good effect. It actually indeed let it grow more. And one of the thoughts that our team has been thinking, since gut is now a new brain, maybe it is the, the good anti-inflammatory profile we see of coronal, it may be attributed towards a potentiation of the gut microbiota growth. So it's not like a real, real uh, prebiotic or probiotic, but we, we did find that the good bacteria in the gut were actually proliferating when coronal was present next to them. Uh, she also has a question in continuation uh, with her uh, this previous question. Also, the action of the Ayurvedic compound is always remained to be slower than that of the allopathic medicine. And if so, can their speed can be somehow increased actually? Uh, that's a good question, and I think our uh, team has been trying to do that. One way of doing it to actually change the size of the particles that we have, and the easy way of doing it to make a nanoparticle out of it. So people are now making uh, carbon quantum dots. We're making a different uh, nano formulations, which eventually would have a better bioavailability. And since bioavailability is going to be central for the efficacy, 
hopefully some success would come. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vashni. We have another one question from uh, Surhi. Uh, her question is, um, as this particular uh, preparation has three different herbs, so I think uh, she wants to ask whether uh, the effect of individual herbs, uh, herb extract was also studied and then in combination whether they have some additive or synergistic effect. Of course. So in the first few slides after the introduction of PRI, I showed the data of ashwagandha glow in isolation in the animal model as well. So we found that the, that the doses both of those her worked in those animal model was slightly higher when they put together in coronal at lower dose you get the same efficacy. So we believe there is some synergy happening. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Anurag, I also have uh, one question actually. It's just an query actually. I was very much um, uh, intrigued by your experiment on the zebra fish actually to measure their fever actually. That was very innovative way actually in that water chamber having this differential temperature. I was wondering like how did you came up with that experiment and why didn't you choose only this particular model and not any other actually model actually. For example, if fever actually maybe the rabbit where we can induce the fever by some pyrogens and then giving coronal actually we can measure actually drop in the temperature. Whether something like that will be feasible or? Uh, that's a good thought but my friend uh, rabbits and rats are, do not get infected by uh, SARS-CoV-2 so even yeah. if you put them uh, this spike protein they do not see any response no inflammation at all God has given those additional unknown powers so they are they are safer right so right. even if you want to induce a fever so we were not looking for a normal fever we were looking for the fever as an inflammatory response to SARS-CoV-2 insult which was not possible to be done in rats, rabbits at that moment of time. Now you have transgenics where you could do this, but this was in 2020, early time. So we were looking for a quick model where we could at least test it. And I tell you, we were very desperate at that time. I mean, I don't know how many people I really contacted at that time. I don't, I think any lab across the world who had that capability, we were actually reaching out to them. And then right. it finally happened in, in, in India. So it's good. Yeah, it was great experiment actually, very, very innovative way. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, Dr. Sapna, actually, my colleague, she also has one question. Yes, yeah, Sapna, ma'am. It is very exciting and apt talk that actually uh, like hit the right chord. My question is to you is that whether uh, Patanjali Research Institute is looking for newer phytoconsequent for newer variants? Oh, yes, oh, we do. We actually, uh, since you ask a question, so I can spill some beans that we were on the verge of making Omicronel, okay, specific great. for for Omicron. And great. that's how we started doing it. But then uh, we realized that Coronel as such was showing a good effect. And we also uh, actually, I think the study already ongoing. We did some experiment with the Omicron specific virus that study is going on in China, where we actually uh, try to see that Coronel would have some effect there or not. If there was no effect or if it has a lesser effect, maybe we could have changed the formulation. And my second question is actually from for the society, whether like any ancient document is digitalized uh, from the Patanjali Research Institute for public portal? Of course, please see our website. OK, great. All the information is there and all the papers I talked about, all of them are listed there. Uh, there lots of uh, videos uh, about the work that we actually, do. Actually, I'm not talking about the research paper. I am talking about the ancient documents like uh, yeah. Vedas, etc. Like, yes. uh, yeah. It is available. Yeah, yeah. Sapna ma'am, it's there. there. Dr. Okay. Vasne, one more thing I just want to uh, ask you, okay, would you, would the Patanjali be like, Ella Patanjali would like to uh, collaborate with the Niper Library regarding some novel molecules? Because as you are, have said that uh, you are working on that. So if you feel comfortable, then we can make an MOU so that along with that things, we can also work on some things. I am more than happy, ma'am. If if that has to happen, I'll be very happy to, to do that. We have a same discussion happened with Dr. Rakesh and he's uh, he has been, you know, very pushy about getting things done and his enthusiasm is fantastic. So I don't think why it cannot be done. So we must do it. We will uh, surely go ahead with this thought and uh, take it ahead on a serious note. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I am very serious, Dr. Rafi. <laughs> <Rafael. laughs> Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Um, uh, once again, thank you, Dr. Vashni, actually, for your um, excellent uh, speech and also 
um, answering like some of the queries from us as well as from the audience actually it was really actually wonderful experience to hear too from you uh, so now i would like to request oh. actually my next uh, thank you thank, thank you sir. sir thank you thank you now i would like to request my colleague actually dr gopal to invite our next eminent speaker over to you dr gopal most welcome dr kedal Thank you, Dr. Ravi. Uh, uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, I, Dr. Gopal, uh, welcoming now our next eminent speaker, uh, Dr. Kedar Purna Patre. Dr. Kedar Purna Patre is currently heading the biological department at Intox Private Limited, Pune. Dr. Purna Patre has around 25 years of experience in pharmaceutical R&D and CRO. He has done his PhD from ISC Bangalore and has over 25 research paper in his credit. He did his postdoctoral research in genetics from USA and further joined uh, Renbexi Research Laboratories and worked there on several projects uh, in the field of infection and inflammation. Thereafter, he joined as a head of Pune's first dedicated Clinical Genomic Laboratories with German Venture, Pernasano, AMI, and now Dr. Pona Patre heading the Bioassay and Biological Services for Biotherapeutics at the Intox Private Limited Pune, which is a part of the Aragon Life Sciences. Today, he will be delivering a talk on modalities and challenges of bioanalysis in preclinical safety assessment of cells and gene therapeutics. With this short introduction, now I invite Dr. Kedar Kunapatre to deliver his talk. Over to you, sir. Uh, Dr. Vashni, can you please unshare your screen? Dr. Vashni, can you please hear us? Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kedar, please actually wait for some time. Actually, I am asking actually Dr. Vashni actually so that he can unshare his screen. Sir, you are unmute. Screen unsharing karna Unsharing one, yes, sir. Dr. Kedar Puna Patre, sir, can you share from your side? Can you hear us? You have to uh, unmute. Can you hear us, sir? Not see where is. Uh, yeah, now you are audible. Now you are audible. Now you are audible. Abhi, I'm sure. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Now it's done. Uh, Doctor, can you hear me now? Doctor Kedar, Pram. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Hello. We yes, can sir. we can hear you. Dr. Anurag, Dr. Anurag is saying hello to you. Namaskar. Yeah, Anurag. Anurag. <laughs> yeah, Pranam Anurag. Good to see you. Nice good to, to see you, sir. So good to hear your talk. It was very exciting. And thank you, Rajesh, nice. for connecting all the uh, people in the same galaxy. Huh? That's fantastic. Yes. <laughs> That's, I would request a repeat performance. <laughs> <laughs> good to see all the okay. seniors with me. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, Rakesh, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. We can see. So can I start or? Yes, sir, you yes, can sir. go yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh and Naipur uh, Rivalry for giving me this opportunity to present uh, the data on what is coming next. 
So basically, it's uh, just a collage of a couple of ideas and slides which has come from literature because we are contract bound by uh, uh, sponsors. So we cannot disclose a lot of intricacies. But my aim here is to introduce students to uh, basically if they can uh, get interested into bioassays and especially bioanalytical, this is going to be a, a good opportunity for them. And uh, it's going to have a big career impact because uh, the job market in bioanalysis is increasing dramatically. So the title of the talk is Modalities, that is the way we work and challenges for bioanalysis of preclinical safety assessment for cell and gene therapeutics. Okay. Can you see the second slide? Yeah, I'll move to the second slide. Yeah, the slides are moving. Right? Hello. Uh, it's not moved to the second slide. Yeah, it's first on title slide. Title slide on. Give me a minute. We are working on this. Uh, I'll be again share this please. Sure, sir. Uh, uh, sir, can you share entire screen? First option. Yeah, are you seeing the second slide now? Still not. Still not. Now, can you see the second slide? Sir, there is a lag period for this. Uh, so you shared something, but uh, we can't see. Okay. Let me try. Okay. Can you share an entire screen? And thereafter, you can begin with. Okay. Can you see it now? No, sir. Not yet. Okay. Uh, can you switch off your uh, camera? So I think there is a network issue. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, so you can switch off your camera. Thereafter, you can share. Sure. Camera off the rest. Okay, so I'm first, now I'm second slide. Can you see it? No, sir. Not yet? Uh, not yet. Uh, it's coming. Let me see. Just wait a few seconds. Yeah. Yeah, we can see now. You can see. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Okay. So I'll continue. Uh, basically, what we are up to is, uh, uh, I'll do almost, I'll do almost like forward and then we can start. Can you see the third slide now? No, sir. That is uh, second only. Approaches. How we? How do? Approaches. We that is are... third slide. Okay. Okay. So it's fine. Now it's going fine. Great. So sorry about this uh, delay. Now we continue. So basically, uh, I think you have a course content called bioanalysis or in your uh, syllabus. So this is what we do here. It's called regulatory bioanalysis and. Uh, Basically, we measure analyte from a given biological matrix, and it has to be quantitative way. And the way it's called regulatory is because we use uh, regulatory guidelines. 
On the left hand side, I have shown you that the number of guidelines which are available and we follow them. And on the right hand side, I have shown our references of the articles which have been used for today's discussion. So in the next slide, it's third slide now. Here I'm talking about approaches, how we do it. So in case you want to uh, quantify any product uh, from the body fluid, it can be serum, it can be blood, it can be plasma, tears, urine. Uh, even tears have been used nowadays for bioanalysis. So in that case, one has to first develop a bioanalytical method. Now, while I'm going through each section, I will also talk about the challenges that come up. When we are given a project, and we told that this is the molecule and uh, if there's a biosimilar for this molecule, which is submitted. So we have to do hand-on study, uh, with comparative studies with biosimilar as well as the innovator. But nobody provides you with a method. So uh, CRO has to design his own method and he has to make sure that the sensitivity is acceptable uh, for both molecules. So method development is the most crucial uh, step because you have to select the right reagents and you have to also get the desired sensitivity and specificity for the assay. Once the method has been developed, then it has to be uh, validated. Uh, and this validation is done under GLB, where basically all the experiments are done by multiple analysts and multiple times. And only validated method qualifies for sample analysis, which is called bioanalysis. And then the entire pharmacokinetics, where you have to define your limit of detection and lower limit of quantification. Then you have to demonstrate linearity where you find the regression coefficient. You do a precision where you look at the percent coefficient of variation. It's also called relative standard deviation or RSD. Look at accuracy where you look at the recovery from the molecule. One looks at stability, which shows percent change. Then selectivity and specificity, where again you have to show that it is precise and accurate. And in recovery, you have to show that your recoveries are. Uh, the, as, as expected. Now, this is the current portfolio of large molecules. We are basically focused on large molecules, and the techniques used are very different from small molecules, which we will see in the coming slides. So, if you look at this, the major chunk of large molecules are monoclonal antibodies, and we are extensively working on them. But interestingly, if you can look at the uh, red circle that I've highlighted, these are the next big molecules which are coming up. These are cell therapy, gene therapy, and therapeutic oligonucleotides. Now, why I am saying that the next big comes into the next slide. I'm on the slide called Innovation Pipeline. So, if you look at what is there in the uh, innovation pipeline now, if you look at that, there is maximum products are cell therapy products, which are under uh, phase trials. And there are about 529. There are gene therapy products, which are 202. There are DNA and RNA therapeutics, around 173, and conjugated monoclonal antibodies are following that. So out of thousands of upcoming molecules, we can see that more than 90% of them are uh, cell and gene therapy products. Now, when we say cell and gene therapy products, we should understand what is a cell therapy product and what is a gene therapy product. So I'm on the slide which shows, says cell versus gene therapies. So the first question comes, is the therapy uh, intact or live cell? And if the answer is no, does it use genetic material for treatment? Is it the DNA or RNA that is used? Then it can be clearly defined as gene therapy. While in cell therapy product, if the cell is directly given without any modification of the treatment, then it goes as a cell therapy. But if it is genetically modified uh, and then introduced to the body, it again com comes into a criteria called as gene therapy. So that's why there's a common term called cell and gene therapies. And we should remember that not all cell therapies are gene therapy. Now, when we have this in mind, the question comes is, what is about CAR-T? Because we all have heard about CAR-T or CAR-NK, which are chimeric antigen receptor T cells or chimeric antigen receptors, natural killer cells. In these cells, we have uh, exogenously we express chimeric antigen receptor uh, in the, uh, the T cells isolated from the uh, patient, and then they are infused back uh, in his body. So these are basically ex vivo gene therapies. So there is a very narrow line between cell therapy and gene therapy. And that's why the topic says cell and gene therapy. And even the guideline, there's a common guideline for cell and gene therapy.
I just want to highlight. I mean, I said there is a huge market potential for this kind of uh, career in this uh, field. If you look at the cell and gene therapy pipeline, that's uh, the slide. Where on the right hand side you can see that there are so many companies who are already uh, into this field, and plus 700 more companies worldwide. While uh, the, I have just listed the uh, kind of therapies which are currently uh, being evaluated or are in clinics, there is CAR T, there is CAR natural killer cells. There are gene therapies, there are stem cell therapies, there are exosome therapies, tissue engineering, biomaterials, and 3D bioprinting. So, so many treatments are going to be available, and for every treatment, there is a need to have a bioanalytical lab which will perform the bioanalysis and uh, provide data. Just to give you a flavor of what is happening in mRNA therapy, this is just a glimpse of Moderna's pipeline. And we can see that they have mRNAs for multiple diseases. Uh, here, they also consider vaccine as a therapeutic model. If you have given vaccine, that it gives a it gives a prophylactic uh, medicine. It's called as a prophylactic medicine. It protects you from the disease. So uh, we have sorry, COVID. sorry to interrupt you, sir. Uh, yeah, your yeah. slide is uh, not moving. Still, you are on a current product. Large molecules. Uh, Are you in Moderna pipeline mRNA therapeutic? And now, yeah, large molecules. That slide, third slide, I think. Oh, so how do we go about that? Is speed is not matching. Yeah, I, I hope. <laughs> so, is there anything that I can share the slides with you, and you can uh, move them? Ah, uh, hi. Yeah, that that is uh, possible, sir. Sure. So I'll do one thing. I'll stop sharing, and uh, I will just uh, share the presentation with you. Will that work? Uh, yeah, sir. Can you share uh, on my number WhatsApp? Oh uh, no, I have it in a uh, desktop. I did all the chat. I can send it to Rakesh. To Rakesh okay, access. okay, okay. Doctor Rakesh, uh, just asking. Yeah, I have shared it with Rakesh. Can he? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. We can we can uh, go ahead from here. I will put slides here, and we can change it from here if it is possible. Sure, Rakesh. Just I take some minute for uh, the mail to go. So okay. Can... Uh, oh. If you want it on the other address, I will just send it. Send it on the official address. I have sent it on your official address.
Hello. Yeah, Rakesh, have you received it? Uh, sir, it's it has not uh, come on that government email ID. Can you send or Gmail? I, that will be better. Yeah, yeah. I have also sent it on Gmail. Now let me see. Uh, just give me a minute. I'll get my IT person. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Sure. No problem. Email. She is coming. Uh, we'll wait for five minutes. Otherwise, what we can do, we can take the next speaker and I'll can go a little later. Uh, it will come, sir. It, on Gmail, it will come. It will come. We can yeah. wait one, two minutes more and then we can. Sure. Do okay. Sure. No worries. Because it is, yeah, it is sitting in my mailbox. I'm just trying to push it. अगर व्हाट्सएप पे भेजें तो दैट आई कैन ऑल्सो डू आई कैन अरेंज इट टू पुट इट ऑन टीम Okay. If it, is it possible to share on WhatsApp, sir? I can put it on Team from here, so from sure. uh, WhatsApp to Team. That will be better. Sure. Then just give it to me, sir. Okay, WhatsApp. What we share.
Open Open uh, to the audiences which we have uh, from Niper River Daily as well as the audiences who are there uh, who have joined us from the outside. Uh, there is a technical glitch as we understand and let's just wait for five minutes and we'll get back to you.
या अभी दिख रहा है राकेश आपको स्क्रीन हेलो यस सर यस सर नाउ इट्स सर विजिबल कैन कैन यू गो टू द नेक्स्ट स्लाइड जस्ट मूव फ्यू स्लाइड में कर श्योर वन सेकंड आपका आवाज सुनाई दे रही है ना यू कैन यू हां यू आर ऑडिबल आल्सो एंड स्लाइड्स आर विजिबल बट कैन यू मूव टू द नेक्स्ट स्लाइड सो वी कैन सी इज इट मूविंग और नॉट आई एम ऑन द सेकंड स्लाइड नाउ uh but yeah 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 you you go ahead okay. sir uh second we can see but uh, third third is approaches how do we do it ha uh, ha yeah how what it's it's only second i think what do we do what do we do okay so third pe nahi ja raha abhi mm hmm i think it will take time yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. now it's third it's a bit slower the net is a bit yeah, slower but it will limited. it will come it will take a lag period of maybe 5 10 seconds or so sure so i'll go uh, i'll take a pause in between yes yes but because i think that other one is not working that's fine so we have yeah, seen this uh, sorry yeah sorry uh, everybody for this uh, technical glitch but this is an interesting topic and i want you to join this field so we will continue with the next slide so yes now yeah. i am an uh, approaches where we had already discussed that we have to develop a method and then we have to validate it and then it is ready for bio analysis and we had also talked about validations that the important things are getting your standards right which is system suitability quality controls uh, regression models and 4 by 6 rules now when we go to gene therapy the rules are very different you do not have a standard curve when you do qpcrs so the challenge is come start right uh, starts from right here that how do you develop your method and if it is developed what are going to be your validation parameters so i am on now fourth slide which is parameters and statistics just let me know when you see that slide yes sir right so basically as i was mentioning uh, bio analysis is nothing but statistics so we have parameters ranging from sensitivity linearity precision accuracy stability specificity and recovery and for each parameter there is a statistical treatment given in order to uh, that for that parameter to qualify so for sensitivity we have lower limit of detection lower limit of quantification for linearity we have regression values for precision there is percent uh, coefficient of variation also called as relative standard deviation for accuracy it is percent recovery for stability is percent change between the two conditions and for specificity it is again accuracy and precision so everything has to be monitored very carefully and uh, before the sample analysis and also during the sample analysis for each and every plate that goes through uh, for screening now i am on the next one which is large molecule uh, current products about large molecules can you see that slide Yes. yes, sir. Yeah. So as as I mentioned that monoclonal antibodies are currently uh, empowering the market, but gene therapy, cell and gene therapy products are uh, going to be the next big thing happening, and that is shown in the next slide, which is innovation pipeline. Now, in this slide, we can see that the highest number of uh, projects which are being uh, currently running in clinical trials. are cell therapy followed by gene therapy dna and rna therapeutics and at the end there is monoclonal antibody conjugates so cell and gene therapy products are uh, the next big thing coming up in pharmaceutical industry i'm going to move to the next slide which is the difference between cell versus gene therapies can you see that slide yes yes sir so now we'll continue i think now it's with a small lag it is working So yeah, the first question comes that what product are you going to call cell therapy and which product is going to be gene therapy? So the answer is very clear. First thing we ask is your therapeutic product a cell? And if the answer is no, then you have to ask a question: Am I using a DNA or RNA or any genetic material for treatment? Then it is qualified as gene therapy. While in cell therapy, if the cell is given without any modification inside the body, then it is just clearly. Uh, defined as cell therapy but if we modify that cell genetically then it belongs to it comes to a category called cell and gene therapy 
And in the next slide, I am showing an example of CAR T, which is chimeric antigen receptor T cell, or there is also nowadays chimeric antigen receptor natural killer cells. They are used in oncology. Now, in this case, we take patients' T cells and then we uh, introduce a chimeric antigen receptors on those T cells and they are put back into the patient's body for treatment. Now, such products are called as ex vivo gene therapy products. So basically, there is a very narrow line between cell and gene therapy products. And that's why even in the guideline, there's a common guideline for cell and gene therapy products. Uh, I'm on the next slide, which is called CGT pipeline, which is cell and gene therapy product pipeline. Can you see that slide? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's a crowded slide, but it just gives you a flavor. On the right hand side, there are the companies who are already, they are claiming that they have products uh, ready for uh, clinical trials or uh, ready to enter into clinics. And I've written there are more, are another 700 more companies. So you can see that how many pharmas in the world are uh, getting into this field. And I'm just, I've listed the uh, G CGT pipeline, which includes CAR-T, CAR-NK, uh, NK cells, gene therapies, stem cell therapies, exosome therapies, tissue engineering and 3D bioprinting. So the, in, the market is soon going to be crowded with these products. And uh, uh, recent uh, introduction of a mRNA vaccine uh, from Moderna uh, has shown that now even RNA can be introduced into the body very easily using lipid nanoparticles. So we can just uh, look at the Moderna pipeline in this slide. And uh, we can see that they have an extensive, this is just one fourth of what they have shown on their website. So there is an extensive pipeline of uh, mRNA therapeutics coming up. And uh, in the next slide, I'm also showing the pipeline of cell therapeutics. I'm just making a platform that for the students to understand that this is what is the next big business and they have to prepare for this. So we can see that uh, uh, for us in preclinical stage, we are involved in the gray bars, which are preclinical studies. So if you look at the gray bars of these products, you can see there is a huge uh, number of products which are in the preclinical stage they will be characterized and then they'll be entering inside the clinics. So uh, uh, this, uh, the next slide, gene therapy, emerging technologies. Uh, this gives an idea of what kind of techniques will be used for gene therapy products. So since a gene therapy product has to be delivered through a vector, it can be a viral vector. One has to look at the virus titer and we do quantitative PCR for that. We use ELISAs to look at the protein product, if that is made inside the body. We also looked at optical density of the gene, uh, the nucleotide. Then you have to also demonstrate that there is a content ratio, that how much uh, of your gene therapy product has is packed inside that uh, part of the carrier that is being used or a vector that is being used. So for that, one uses uh, uh, transmission electron microscopy, one is this ion exchange chromatography. There is also ultra centrifugation techniques. Then one has to also show that these particles uh, do not aggregate because if they are too uh, aggregated, then they will not be delivered to the target site. So for that also, there are uh, various techniques like SEC, you again have ultra centrifugation and you have uh, SLS and DLS. So basically the techniques that will be used uh, in coming days are going to be these techniques. And now we will go to the guidelines. I'll just give a quick glimpse of guideline and I will show you the difference between small and gene therapy products. So this is a guideline by FDA, uh, which generally the first guidelines normally comes up with FDA and then most of the guidelines, guidelines are built up on this. So this is a, a common guideline for uh, investigational cell and gene therapy products. And what this guideline shows has been summarized in the this slide. So basically for any product, one has to demonstrate the proof of concept. And in proof of concept studies, one has to show that you have effective dose range for your product. But it also has to show that there is a therapy product route of administration so, that is a cell and gene therapy product reaches the target. And one has to also show that the time of uh, product administration relative to the onset of disease, you have to figure out the doses, how frequently you'll give it, and you have to also confirm the mechanism of action. Besides that, they insist that since this is a, a foreign uh, material, to one has to the show that there is uh, what kind of human, humoral or cellular responses are there for this product. The most important thing is vector biodistribution. Uh, one has to also show the fate, whether the product, how long does it stay inside the body? And there is a shedding study uh, also done where we show that uh, whether the product is excreted into the environment 
through your uh, excretory system, and one has to also press the biomarkers. And the most important thing is histochemistry to also show that product was expressed into desired tissues. So the gamut of assays that are being used are different. And that is what this says, that the standard AME, ADME pharmacokinetics that we use for small molecules will not hold for this. The differences uh, basically are going to be, the major emphasis has to be on the distribution of cell and therapy products, whether uh, they confine to the desired site or they also move around in the body and uh, cause safety concerns by moving to other target sites. And currently, uh, this has this is pursued mostly through imaging uh, techniques. It can be either one can use radio-labeled uh, cells, or one can use genetically modified cells which express GFP or luciferase gene. Uh, one can also have nanoparticle label cells. So, yes. Oh. Uh, yeah. Slides are not visible. Can we share from our side because we received your uh, slides? Sure. So we will. Uh, so what do I do? I just uh, exit from here. No, just I'll just unshare. unshare. Okay, I'll do that. Actually, yeah. Uh, suddenly the connection is going. Yeah, yeah, sir. So uh, just let me know where you were there. In the slides. slides, can you see the slides? Yeah, uh, one second. I will just unshare, right? We shared uh, the slides. The Are the slides yeah. able to use, sir? Yes, I'm. You're on the second side, right? Regulatory guidelines. Yes. Ah, yeah. Yeah. So just move on. Yeah, next is GCT bioanalysis. So go back. Yeah, go back a slide. Go back. Okay. So this is regulatory. And, uh, yes. So yeah, we are on this one. Day. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. I'll to move to the next one. Great. Yeah. So these are imaging techniques. We have discussed that it can be a radio level cell. It can be a cell expressing a, a GFP or luciferase gene. It can be PCR analysis of your uh, gene therapeutic product. Immunohistochemistry to identify if the gene therapy product was expressed inside the target cells and also to confirm uh, whether the cell line is from an origin or from a different karyotype. Yes, next slide, please. Yeah, so this basically summarizes the key parameters that have to be considered for bioanalysis of cell and gene therapy product. The most important is biodistribution, uh, which tells you the safety and efficacy. Then one looks at molecular genomics, whether it's a relevant species. One looks at biomarker analysis to show that there is mechanism of action is being followed. And also one looks at cytokine uh, release syndrome because a lot of times cell uh, cells will induce uh, cytokines and that will be harmful to the body. One has to also evaluate whether the target protein is produced and immunogenicity because you are ex uh, sending of ex exogenous particle, foreign particle inside the body. And uh, there can be a pre-existing uh, antibodies already to viral vectors. Like now we have all taken uh, AAV virus uh, vaccines or COVID, so our body will have antibodies against it. So next time if you use same AAV, then that therapy will not be effective. And one also looks at uh, cellular kinetics, whether the cells are proliferating inside the body by flow cytometry. So let's go to the next slide, and it shows the kind of techniques that are being used. Biorestoration is mostly done through qPCR and in vivo imaging uh, and immunohistochemistry. Molecular genomics is again uh, done through PCR and sequence analysis. Biomarker analysis is done through uh, PCR, ELISA, and functional bioassays. Because a lot of times uh, when you go for enzyme replacement therapy, you have to show that your body is uh, making that enzyme. Uh, besides that, when I also look at evaluation, in for evaluation proteins, we have techniques like ELISAs, LCMS, and then there are those high performance ELISA, ELISAs like MCD. Immunogenicity is mostly done by ELISA, ELI spot, and fax analysis. I think we have lost your screen here. And for cellular kinetics, it's flow cytometry, qPCR, and DDPCR. Can we go to next? Yes, sir. Yeah, so for the, uh, these are the new platforms for which we have to be ready now, especially mesocell discovery platform, uh, which does a high-end ELISAs is a very important technique that is being used uh, in bioanalytical labs. Besides that, your fax calibrator uh, is used. BioCore is already used to find out affinity of your molecule to the target cell. And uh, applied this QS, uh, PCRs are done, um, uh, 
as well as that uh, there are automated ELISAs like Roche, Kubas, or Gyro Labs. So this is what we need to study when we uh, go for uh, our interviews next time. Next slide, please. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I have just uh, um, highlighted some challenges, but I'll call this as opportunities because what we look forward to is if the uh, students who are doing their masters can work on any of these pro projects, they will have uh, uh, easy entry into the industry because these are the things which uh, with which the uh, service industry is struggling now. First thing happens is matrix selection because uh, sometimes it's very difficult to actually get that tissue portion. You cannot do a biopsy in a living organism and that's why one has to create a surrogate matrix. Another issue is sensitivity of uh, uh, assays because uh, these gene therapy products can actually go at a picogram concentrations in the tissue. So one has to develop very sensitive ligand binding assays. Then interference of endogenous material is there. So one has to work on what kind of uh, calibrators will be used. Then assessment of functions. So one has to have suitable uh, high sensitive assays. Quantitation of number of therapeutic cells. For that, there are different techniques uh, used. So one has to uh, work it out. Inti and most important is integration site analysis. Because a vector can integrate and stay inside the body and can create uh, 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 deregulate or deregulate certain human genes. So for that, this analysis is done through uh, next gene sequencing, but newer techniques are required and also optimization is required. Uh, also, as I mentioned, pre-existing antibodies to vector. So there have to be sensitive assays to uh, quickly characterize it because patients are first screened in clinical trial that they do not have pre-existing antibodies to vector and only after that are administ administered this gene therapy products. And also a very critical thing, which is a uh, little small, but labeling of non-antibody proteins. Usually uh, when you do any uh, ligand binding assay, you need a labeled uh, molecule for detection. And, uh, and labeling techniques for antibodies are very well demonstrated. But when you have short peptides or you have some unusual molecules, labeling uh, has to be optimized thoroughly. So these are the challenges which industry is facing, but I see them as an opportunity for anybody to take them as a project and uh, work on it. Next slide. I'm just uh, highlighting the benefit. All the preclinical studies, regulatory preclinical studies are done in uh, GLP. This is OLP, OECD GLP compliant labs, where the advantage is that entire data has been documented thoroughly. So there is a traceability for study of the data. The data is archived and kept for nine years. So one can always uh, go back and reconstruct the study. And it is fully compliant with the uh, regulatory requirements. So it is accepted all over the world when the study is done under GLP. And also uh, that uh, that's why it is worldwide. It has worldwide importance. So one has to be also aware of GLP. It is not just good laboratory practices that are followed, but there is an OECD GLP guidelines. So one should be aware uh, when you enter into the biomedical field. Next slide, please. Yeah, this slide shows your career opportunities. If you can look at uh, this slide, uh, if we see there is about 12.4 billion market for biomedical services. And the blue bar shows the market for small molecules and the orange one is for large molecules. This is the situation in 2021, but in 2031, it's going to be reverse. Large molecules are going to capture most of the market. So you can see that there are uh, huge job opportunities in this field because the market is growing uh, drastically. Next slide, please. Yes. Yeah, besides that, uh, there's a consortium of global gene therapy initiative they are focusing on a country like India, Uganda, and they are going to try and uh, conduct a lot of clinical trials for these upcoming uh, gene therapy molecules for neglected diseases. So overall, I can, uh, what I can sum up is that there is a huge market. This is a new field. We have very few people who are skilled in this field. And also there is a clinical trial happening in India. Next slide, please. So basically, uh, one when you're looking at your career, you should consider bioanalysis or bioanalytical um, career in bioanalysis because of the market companies with innovative products very quickly. That is all I have for today. If there are any questions, I'll answer. And sorry for all the technical picture. Yes. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir, for nice uh, talk. Yes, yeah, so, uh, thank you very much. Uh, what you have discussed is uh, very relevant in today's scenario. So any any question from the uh, audience or participant? 
Yeah, come come and introduce yourself and uh, put your query. And you can uh, put your query in the chat box uh, as well. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, it is very inf informative presentation. Myself, Vishwas Bharti uh, from pharmaceuticals department. Sir, I have a query that uh, as we are working on uh, large molecules, so the sample processing techniques in bioanalysis, uh, is it different uh, for the processing of the small molecules? It's like in small, uh, for the processing of small molecules, there are three different techniques for sample processing. So I just wanted to know that uh, for large molecules, are, are those techniques are same or different? Oh, wonderful question. Actually, yes, you, there's a huge difference. So in small molecules, we mostly use LCM, SMS. So you strip them out of protein. But large molecules are protein bound. So matrix plays a very important in large molecule bioanalysis. So the techniques are different. And the way actually we conduct assays, you take a uh, serum or plasma, you spike your molecule, and then you, you do your assays. Well, for small molecules, you'll extract them with acetonitrile, dry them out, and then you can do. So even the sensitivity also varies between the techniques. Yes. But then if you are aware of the parameters for small molecules, it doesn't take a very long time to learn large molecule bioanalysis. The parameters more or less remain similar, just that the techniques are different. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sir, we have a question from Dr. Pratima Tripathi. Uh, so question is, uh, is there any mechanism of uh, delivering the exosomes specifically to the site of action? Uh, they can, uh, at the moment, this is a very new research, but yes, they can uh, conjugate it with some fabs and that can reach there. So you can have a nanoparticle uh, with a signal peptide or something. So that, that is coming up. Okay, uh, any question, other questions? Okay, sir, so you have discussed about the gene therapy and uh, the related therapies. So would you comment on this, uh, like say, the other kind of diseases which are not actually affected from the genes? So like say, some kind of metabolic diseases which uh, may not be regulated or may not be affected from gene. So could we uh, actually target or uh, overcome these kind of diseases by using the gene therapy or related therapies? Uh, yes, for metabolic diseases, now we have enzyme replacement therapy. So there are two ways. Uh, there are other enzymes are injected directly inside the body, but the concern is that uh, since you already have endogenous enzymes, there is a risk of high immunogenicity and uh, immune in intolerance. So uh, there are also gene therapy approaches where you can uh, uh, put that gene inside the body and it will constantly make that enzyme and uh, reduce deficiency. So uh, see the thing they are saying is that gene therapy will actually be a, a use for targets which are not druggable till date. So anything you want to modify inside the body, it will it can be done using uh, gene therapy or cell therapy. Right, so okay. there are also references where they use uh, RBCs. So you add your in protein of interest into the RBCs and those RBCs are injected in the body and the protein deliveries are happening. Thank you, sir, for uh, such a nice talk. And uh, I think uh, all of us are uh, very much overwhelmed about your uh, uh, discussion on the gene therapy and the other aspects of this. I, I, I have a question uh, related to yes. this, uh, particular with respect to antibodies development. As mm -hmm. we are aware that uh, from literature, we see that the number of small molecules approved in last 10, 15 years has been constantly decreasing. And it's almost like nil now. But the mm -hmm. number of antibodies approved by FDA has been increasing um, regularly in recent mm -hmm. years. So uh, there is a market potential for antibodies, that is for sure, for antibodies or for other such therapies, biological therapy. Mm -hmm. So what is your opinion on uh, like uh, small molecules and uh, biological competition? Uh, in terms of their clinical potential, actual clinical potential, not the market potential. Right, those small molecules do have potential. It's just that uh, it's crowded now and there is less innovation happening because we have faced it. 
in our organizations also. The what I see now coming up is antibody drug conjugates. So it's a mixture of both that you are conjugating your small molecule with the antibody. It will take it to the right tissue, and that way the safety of small molecules will increase. Because the issue with small molecule was that at high concentrations they are toxic to the body. They create uh, undesired e efforts. But if you target them to the right set using antibody fragments, that is what is coming up very well. So it's going to stay, and I think that will be a marriage between both uh, treatment techniques. Hmm. So these these things are like people are working on it. The antibody is conjugated with a small molecule. Maybe that is yeah. Not yeah. There is a use ADC. Even the IHA has launched uh, recently Herceptin uh, with a small molecule as an ADC conjugate. So antibody drug conjugates, and we also do anal bioanalysis here. And it's uh, the beautiful thing is that in that you have both ligand binding assay for your antibody, and you also use LCMS for the small molecule. So that is an interesting where, thing where you need experience in both fields uh, for bioanalysis, and there are huge ideas coming in the market. Thank you. So it was really like indeed a fascinating to listen to this talk, and this field is like it's good, it's evolving well. Sure, and I would definitely like to visit your campus next year sure, and we'll have face-to-face -face talk definitely. Uh, we will call you whenever we have an opportunity to call offline and uh, we will give our students an opportunity to interact with uh, such companies who are working on biologicals specifically. Sure, sure. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be with you. Sorry for all the technical glitches. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All the best to all the students and we are looking forward to you joining the industry very soon. All yes. the best. Sure, sir. We will. Connect with the, all these students who are interested. On that front, I will talk to you personally because <laughs> it, I'm also looking at the placements of students. Absolutely. We'll be working together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, Thank you. So uh, moving ahead with the session, I think uh, let's go for lunch now uh, because we, are, uh, we have listened to three uh, extensive lectures by eminent experts in their field. And... Uh, we will meet again at 2.30 with uh, 